Um, hey guys, what's up? Hello safely, hello the grief, how you doing? Uh, hope your week is going fantastic. Hey Ravalanim, what is up? So tonight we have a strategical topic. Uh, on the stream uh, winning with the bishop pair looks like a simple topic but it's actually quite quite complex I think so let's see what can we do this topic was requested by last sub Ingle and here here he is Ingle welcome here we go yes uh, thanks for redeeming your perk I think this is uh, a great topic to discuss. Um, I'll try my best. <laughs> so, um, I think we can start. I basically didn't prepare anything. Uh, hello, Alera, Alera, twenty-six. What is up? Um, so basically I didn't prepare anything, I think it's a topic that sooner or later I will prepare some study uh, like you know trying to analyze the most important aspects of it but I hope we can discuss them today just by improvising. Anyway what I really did was picking up a bunch of games <laughs> from Madrid nice um, um, I've been to Madrid many times. Um, yeah, what I did was I picked up a bunch of games, uh, 17 actually. Um, some of them are mine from my own games and some others are from great players like Vichy Anand, Geller, Kramnik, etc. And all those games feature at some point uh, the bishop pair for the winning side because we're talking about winning with the bishop pair which you know it's nice that you said winning with the bishop pair because that narrows a bit the topic because <laughs> yeah it would be also a good topic to discuss um, saving games with the bishop pair or stuff like that or even winning against the bishop pair but okay today we're gonna focus on winning with the bishop pair it could have been better to learn how to lose with the bishop pair, but anyway, <laughs> that for another for another day, Tenta Chess. Actually, it's nice because I was looking for games. Hey, Martin, when I was looking for games, I found quite a decent amount of games where Anand was winning with the bishop pair, and he's very well known to to play to like playing against the bishop pair. So, okay, I guess when you're a good player. Um, you can manage any situation. Maybe next month losing with the bishop pair, yeah. Which could be renamed as winning against the bishop pair, of course. So, um, before we go, looks uh, basically I have a bunch of games that are examples. Uh, of course, the bishop pair is just one strategical factor, and of course, there's no game that you can say. Uh, Oh, in this game, this side won because he had the bishop pair, and that's it. Uh, <laughs> in the games we're gonna see, uh, there are several other strategical factors that we're gonna try and focus on on the importance of the bishop pair. So, starting from the beginning, uh, what is the bishop pair? What do we call the bishop pair? I don't know if maybe there's some uh, beginners in the chat who. Um, so, so I want to to start from the scratch, although we're gonna get very soon to the games. Um, how to lose with bishop pair, just do the opposite of today's session, <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so what do we call the bishop pair? Let's, let's be clear from the beginning. Uh, obviously bishop pair means the two bishops, when you have the two bishops, but we say you have the bishop pair when you have the two bishops and your opponent does not. That's important to, to say. So usually, usually, um, you one of the of the 
sides gets the bishop pair when his opponent decides to trade one of his bishops, usually for a knight. But there are other cases, of course. Uh, for example, you can decide to sacrifice an exchange for one of your opponent's bishops, then you win the bishop pair. But your opponent has something in return, in this case material. Um, and maybe sometimes um, your opponent sacrifices a bishop for a couple of pawns. So there are many situations where you can have the bishop pair and it's not quite after, you know, that uh, bishop pair knight uh, had happened. But yeah, I think in the games we're gonna see some examples of those. But yeah, in general, if you have the two bishops and your opponent doesn't have the two bishops, that's what you what we call having the bishop pair, as you all know, of course. Now, what is it so good about it? I mean, all grandmasters want to have the bishop pair. Why? Why? How how could this be so important about the bishop pair? How could be this? A strategical advantage for 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 the side who has it. Um, what do you think, guys? Just asking some. Uh, I'm just starting with some questions. Hey, Candela, to to see whether we share a common language or a common knowledge before going to the games, because in the games we're gonna. Uh, we're gonna see these topics again and again and again. Long distance, yeah, like the bishops have a long, long range. Yes. What is the difference between mistake and blunder? I see the counts on the right side. It's the the kind of blunder is just a big mistake. <laughs> uh, mistake is maybe when you you give some advantage to your opponent, but it's not a big one. And blunder is when you pass from winning to drawing or from winning to losing, stuff like that. Uh, bishops can control both sides of the board and knights cannot. Okay, yeah, that's definitely related to the long range uh, uh, of the bishops. But both of you told me <laughs> what is good about a bishop versus a knight. But what is it good about the bishop pair? That's today's topic. Uh, BM Fuchs, thanks for the follow. You control more squares the long diagonal. KNV Bay doesn't prefer bishops. Yeah, but uh, some other day we can analyze <laughs> Eman's play. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, definitely bishops are better than knights sometimes, and we're going to discuss that as well. Uh, so in general, you prefer to have the two bishops, because if your opponent doesn't, um, that means at some point you have a bishop versus a knight. But that's not quite it, I think. That's not quite it. Um, Bishop pair control both color complex. Yes, yes, that's more or less it. Both bishops together can control many squares along the diagonals. Also, if you have the pair, the opponent has not exactly. That's the point. Exactly, that's the point. And is missing control on one of the colors. Exactly. I think when you use the both bishops, you can restrict the king. Yeah, that's a point for end games. Yes, that's a good point, Ravelani. Yeah, I think the key concept, and <laughs> precisely coming from our definition of what is having the bishop pair, it's not just that you have the two bishops, it's that you have the two bishops and your opponent doesn't. And I think that's the key point. Uh, your opponent is is lacking, is missing at least one of the bishops. Sometimes even the two of them, but at least one of them. So that means, let's say, for example, you have the common case. You have the two bishops and your opponent has a knight and a bishop. If that bishop controls the light squares, that means you're going to control the dark squares more than him. Because you have a dark square bishop and he doesn't. And that's the key point when it comes to strat strategy. When you have the two bishops and your opponent doesn't, you need to realize uh, what bishop does he have. Okay, then he's going to have problems in the other color. 
uh, therefore you should put pressure on every possible weakness you can find in the other color because you're not, you're gonna have one piece more to attack that color complex than your opponent has to defend it uh, this also means evaluating the position is connected to evaluating how good your unique bishop is. If you have a black square bishop being dominated by pawns, it sucks. Um, yes, but still it's a long-term advantage, the bishop pair. And for example, I, I have an example that I think we're going to see because that was my last game. Uh, it was a horrible game, but I, I'll show it. Um, when... I had the bishop pair, but it was horrible. I mean, I could do nothing with my bishops. But eventually, we got to an endgame, and the bishop pair was completely winning the endgame. So, yeah, sometimes you just have the bishop pair, and you don't see in the short term how, how good they are. But still, it's a long-term advantage. And one thing we know about bishops is they're so great in open positions. So they really excel in endgames. So, even, you know, as compared to other advantages that can be more temporal, like space advantage or, or development, uh, the bishop pair is really a long-term advantage that if you can keep it till the end, um, the bishop pair can be really, really strong in an endgame. Especially if you have pawns in both sides of the board, because as some of you already mentioned, the bishops are really great uh, controlling both sides of the board so I think we we already discussed um, part part one of uh, of the bishop per issue which is what is it good about it but now I would like to discuss the most critical part of it which is um, how to convert bishop per, the bishop pair advantage to other advantages. And, you know, it's really hard to find a game where <laughs> um, you start the game in the opening, your opponent gives bishop, you know, has a bishop on g4, takes the knight on f3, typical case, use case. Um, so in the opening, you get the bishop pair, then nothing happens throughout throughout the game and in, and you get to an end game where you have the two bishops you win that's not the common scenario the common scenario of a, of a game is the bishop pair is just one of the of the strategical factors and at some point you can convert that advantage into a different advantage hey oj what is up so i would like to take a moment uh, although we're going to see it through examples i would like to take a moment now to discuss which, uh, which advantages can we get by converting the bishop pair? So if you have the bishop pair uh, by, for example, trading one of the bishops, how can you, how can you get another advantage? I don't know if, <laughs> if I'm explaining myself. Um, let's put an example. The typical scenario would be you have two bishops, your opponent has a bishop and a knight. Uh, let's just take that scenario, which is the most common. You have the two bishops, your opponent has one bishop and one knight. Um, that means that at some point, maybe, you can trade one of your bishops for the knight, or one of your bishops for the bishop of your opponent. So let's think for a moment, in which scenarios could that be a good thing? And obviously, in, in chess, everything is about tactics, and sometimes you have a tactical reason, and that's it. Sometimes, um, by trading, you expose your opponent's king, or you get to promote a pawn, or whatever tactical reason. But let's not talk about. Let, let's just uh, think strategically, in a strategical uh, from a strategical point of view. Let's say there's no immediate tactical reason what would be a good strategical reason to trade one of your bishops for the knight or one of your bishops for your opponent's bishop in that scenario of two bishops versus knight and bishop. Uh, does my question make sense? Or do you prefer to go to examples and then I'll ask the questions there?
Makes sense. Okay. Okay. So Ingol is trying to answer there. Giving up the bishop pair has to give some other advantage, maybe doubling pawns. I've done that in an over the board game before and engine liked it. Yeah, okay, cool. That's a cool one. Uh, doubling pawns. Yeah. Usually when you double your opponent's pawns, um, uh, you're also breaking the structure. It's not just doubling. Usually when you double pawns, uh, you're probably isolating some pawns as well. So that's usually a good strategical reason. So yeah, good one. Good, good, uh, good suggestion there. Let's um, talk about the pieces themselves. Uh, let's say there are no no tactical reasons and and no structural reasons. You you don't uh, get to ruin the structure like doubling pawns. Then what would be a good scenario for for example to trade one of your bishops for the opponent's bishop? Let's start with that one. You have two bishops, your opponent has bishop and knight. And when would it be great to trade one of your bishops for your opponent's bishop? What do you think, guys? If our bishop is more blocked, I trade if I know that my opponent after the trade will have a bad bishop or a bad knight. Mm -hmm. If it's a worse piece, okay. If our bishop is just bad in the position, example gets dominated because all enemy pawns are on the traded bishop's colors. Okay. Okay, I guess what you say, what all that you say make, makes sense, although that looks a, like a pretty def defensive reason to me. <laughs> like, oh, our bishop is bad, let's trade it. Which is okay, which is fine. I mean, it's a good reason. But there could be actually a very good reason to to trade one of your one of our bishops, you know, to lose the bishop pair. Uh, trading one of our bishops for the opponent's bishop. Trade if his bishop is good. Okay. Different perspective. Yeah, but uh, you're saying the okay, okay, different perspective. Yeah. Okay, okay. I agree with uh, what all of you say. But I think that wouldn't be my, my most common case. Um, my most common reason to trade one of my bishops for, for my opponent bishop would be to get to an endgame. Uh, of course, if he has bishop and knight and I have two bishops and I trade one of my bishops for his bishop, I'm getting to a bishop versus knight situation where I have the bishop. So, <laughs> putting my my previous question in another words when is it good to have bishop versus our opponent's knight we can hit color squares when is it great a bishop against a knight predictive text a uh, weekend yeah predictive <laughs> When the endgame favors the bishop, pawns on both sides. Yeah, that's a great answer, Ingol. When you can have your bishop in the center squares during the endgame. Yeah, in an endgame, for example, uh, if you have pawns in both sides of the board, I would definitely trade one of my bishops for my opponent's bishop because the knight will have such a hard time defending against the bishop. So that's definitely a way to, to play for the win in a... Um, easy technical way open position working against weaknesses on both sides yeah yeah of course bishops are better in, in open positions so that means that that actually gives us a hint also in the middle game when you have the bishop pair you usually try to open the position your opponent usually tries to close the position we're gonna see that in the examples as well um, and yes, if we have the two bishops and our opponent has bishop and knight, I would trade one bishop for the opponent's bishop when the end game is clearly favorable to the to the bishop, which is typically when there are pawns in both sides of the board. 
Uh, now, the trickiest is when would you trade for the knight? When would you go for a bishop versus bishop situation? That's the trickiest question. And I think we're gonna see at least one example of this that I did in a game. We probably see more examples of converting the bishop pair advantage in a bishop versus bishop good situation. If I'm pawns down and I get opposite color bishops to increase drawing odds, <laughs> that's a good answer. Yes, although since today uh, today's topic is um, winning with the bishop pair, we're not going to see examples of that, but that's a good answer as well, yeah. When I have pawns, when I have my pawns on the same color than his bishop to restrict him, uh, eesh, almost, that, yeah, that answer can be a good one or a bad one depending on the case because we didn't talk about the cases but there are two cases in this scenario again to get into the end game it sounds like an for quartillo <laughs> yeah again to get <laughs> into the end game you want was going to say a drawing one depending on your level of ambition yeah we're talking about winning today so uh when would you when would you trade uh one of your bishops for the knight to play for the wing that's the question and we have two cases. Either you go for an opposite color bishops situation or for a same color bishop situation. So now we need to think when bishop versus bishop of same color can be good to play for the wing and when bishops of opposite colors can be good to play for the wing. Those two cases. And in, in those two scenarios, if they exist, uh, that would be a good trade for us. So this yeah this reminds me of what a friend of mine usually says that he he, he says he, you should you should only study end games in chess because then you have all the understanding you 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 required <laughs> and yeah if you understand really what end games are good and what end games are bad for you uh, you can make this kind of strategical decisions let's say easily hey malek what is up usually you can tell which side is better by pong structure um yeah and uh, of course i said already um, in the games we're gonna see the bishop pair mixed up with other statistical factors like pawn structure but yeah we're now speaking in a <laughs> bishop pair focus mode level only and trying to separate this strategical factor from the others but of course everything is gonna has to be taken into consideration. So Ingol says, well, opposite color bishops favor the side with the bishop that can attack stuff. Mm, almost, I almost agree. You obviously want your pawns on opposite color to your bishop. Yes, I'm talking about same color bishop ending. Also, so okay, so let's talk about the two of them. Uh, and I'm gonna give my my understanding <laughs> I would and I, I think I did actually in one of the games we're gonna see I would trade one of my bishops for the opponent's knight to go into an opposite bishops uh, color situation to play for the wing if there's more material especially heavies uh, rooks and or queens because in those situations, uh, as you know, or you should know, um, if, if there are only pawns and opposite color bishops, they tend to be very drawish. It doesn't really matter which color the pawns are, they're very drawish. But if you have more pieces and you can actually develop attacks, then it's all about the initiative, the initiative and who can attack more. Uh, because the side who gets to attack will have an extra attacker, so to speak, at least in the colors of, of, of their bishop. So, so yeah, Ingol said, Ingol said, uh, favor the side with the bishop that can attack stuff, but I would say that 
it's more if it's opposite color bishops and some pawns are blocked and so if your bishop can attack something the opponent's bishop can attack something as well so it's not just the bishop can attack it's also if there are other pieces so you can develop an attack not only with the bishop it's not so easy often yeah sure and and of course that's a different topic i mean we could do a a, a whole series of streams on the topic of attacking with with opposite color bishops like you know you want the, the, the bishop in an attacking position usually in a, in a safe spot defended by a pawn uh, that cannot be attacked etc etc but so you go for a mate attack on the weak squares yeah not necessarily a mate attack but um, at least attacking some weaknesses that uh, lead you to to win material or open lines against the opponent's king yes uh, hey hypo, hypo hippo hippo defense hello what is up so I think that would be my only scenario to to do that trade to play for the wing of course there's the other scenario that uh, Ingol said already that you sometimes go for that trade like to play for the draw to increase your drawing chances to go into an endgame of opposite color bishops um, Alex says, I'm even talking about opposite color bishop ending, let's say one pawn up, you can often still put a lot of pressure. Nah, not really. I mean, always, you can play forever, but uh, so pressure is there always, but it's usually very drawish, unless you have already something like a pawn very advanced or stuff. <laughs> My beard grew. Yeah, keeps doing that. Okay, and what about the other situation? The, the other situation is maybe easier. <laughs> You're quoting Anish Giri, okay. <laughs> uh, the other situation is maybe easier when you tried the bishop for the knight to go into a same color bishop's ending. When would that be great? Um, Drawish Giri, exactly. When when would he, when would we um, give away our beloved bishop pair to go into a bishop versus bishop with same color bishops? When could that be so great for us? And I think Malek already said something about it <laughs> a moment ago. Yeah, he said you obviously want your pawns on opposite color to your bishop. Um, hmm. Yeah, so rewarding what Malek said. Um, that would be a great endgame for you when your bishop is a good bishop and your opponent's bishop is a bad bishop. Simple as that. For example, all um, all of your pawns are in the opposite color of your bishop. That means your bishop is a good bishop. But because the, the bishops are the same color, they're all also in opposite color of the opponent's bishop. So the opponent's bishop cannot attack any of your pawns. Uh, conversely, you can attack all of his pawns and his bishop will have to be defensive. And if you have pongs in both sides of the board or several pongs that usually that usually is a good um, a, a technical win and if your opponent has two weaknesses it's very often winning exactly if you have many pong, many pongs um, still on the board it's usually a win so that would be another way to convert the bishop pair into a winning uh, endgame and of course there are other ways uh, because we only talked about the typical scenario of two bishops versus bishop and knight but yeah you can have the bishop pair because you sacrificed an exchange so uh, there are other cases where you have the bishop pair not necessarily because your opponent took a knight with a bishop but okay too much too much talking already let's go through some examples so I'm gonna start Unless you request me something, 
Uh, I have some games from my own games. Some games from my own? I have some games of my own. And I have some games from Stain, Anand, Botvinnik, Geller, Kramnik. Uh, so some games for, from great players who have no mistakes. <laughs> and some games of my level which uh, maybe, maybe at some point they're easier to understand. So didn't I wasn't very sure which one to start with. Um, so if you have any specific request, what Magnus did with Dim recently is also a great example of how powerful Bishop Air can be. Oh, I don't have that game, but if you if you if you link or, uh, or if you give me a link to the PGN or something, I could I could show it right now on this study. Okay, cool. In the meantime, I think we can start with this game that I already loaded that was played last week between Spanish Grandmaster Jaime Santos Latasa versus... I want to see Sam Volvinic. We can go to Volvinic, I don't know. Um, I will let Ingol uh, take the decisions uh, because, you know, it's his topics request anyway, so... <laughs> There's no. I, I don't have any specific reason to show one games or another. I just recall some of the themes in some games. In some games, the bishop clear is obviously a decisive strategic factor, like this game I'm gonna show. And in others, it's mixed with some others. So let's let's go watch this this game. I'm gonna fast forward. Probably uh, the openings. Thanks for the link. I'm gonna open it and and we'll, we'll show that after. Your games are also cool because you know them better. Yeah, also that. Also that. Yeah, some. That's definitely true. I can tell you probably more things about what I was thinking and so. And probably also closer to your to your own level. <laughs> so. So I'm gonna show uh, this game and Magnus's game, and then I probably move to some of my games if if you are okay with that. So yeah, I'm gonna fast forward some moves. Let's just see all the themes, and I'm curious how you did. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is Spanish Grandmaster Jaime Santos Latasa with with white pieces. He's a very strong player, almost 2600. And he's playing against Parham uh, Makshudlu, which I'm sure you know because he's a, a rising star in Iran, I think. Um, I'm gonna show this game quick, and and then I'm gonna see Magnus's game. Yes, that the same Parham exactly, <laughs> uh, and then I'm gonna move to my examples. No, I didn't, Ipo. Okay, so this was a preparation in the opening. He played d4, although he's, he's giving up a pawn to have a grip on d6. Uh, but at some point, he will have to lose one of the bishops. I'm gonna ex move forward uh, for a bit, and here it comes. So at, at this point, black grabs the, the bishop pair. By giving up an exchange. This was a great game, by the way, by, by Max Shudlu. In this case, as, as we said already, one way to, to win the bishop pair is sacrificing an exchange by taking a bishop with one of your rooks. In this case, it's the same but the opposite, letting your opponent take a rook with, with the bishop, which is what happened here. So black sacrifice and exchange, he had a good reason. It's not just the bishop pair, he, he gets to, <laughs> to, to retain his extra pawn. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on the tactics, this, this part of the game is a bit messy, but the outcome is that after those two pawns get taken in the center, black has the bishop pair. And what is worst for white, <laughs> white doesn't even have a bishop. So this is uh, bishop pair against knight pair or rook's pair so these two bishops are gonna be awesome in this game uh, they're gonna control a lot of squares now it looks like 
white has a good blockade here. The, the two knights are blocking this, this bishop somehow. So this bishop cannot attack b2 now. This bishop cannot attack the castle, the castle king so far. But that's not going to be there forever, of course. Some pressure on d4. Um, look at that. Yeah, oof. So, another typical situation when you have the bishop pair, uh, a good price for it to pay is some damage in the pawn structure. So a moment ago, black had double pawns, but now it's not even that. <laughs> and what you want to do, what, what you want to have usually um, when you have the bishop pair is open lines and open diagonals. So you don't mind double pawns so much if you have bishop pairing in return because double pawns usually mean you have open lines for your bishops and sometimes for your rooks as well. Yeah, in this case, those bishops are, are amazing now. Trace rooks. Ugh, look at this, this funny rook. So white is an exchange up, but that rook is suffering a lot. Has almost no squares. Ugh, <laughs> rook a2. And here comes the pawn. So the engine says this is an, an equal position. It says 0.00, .00 but from now on the game goes all in black's favor because this is much easier to play for, for black now. Um, just total control. He denies white the coordination of his rooks with the bishop pair. Yeah, in this case uh, he's denying the rook to, to get active and yeah, they're basically putting a lot of pressure, but he's not doing anything concrete, so to speak. He's not like, um, oh, I'm going to build a checkmate attack. No, he's just there controlling a lot of squares. And at this point, white collapsed and and tried to give the, the exchange back to to be able to play something, because in this position, white is almost in Sukhswan. The engine still thinks this is um, equal. But it's hard to find moves for, for white, <laughs> to be honest. Um, look how funny is this queen and this rook. What can we move? The queen has no moves that I can see. Um, any, any move of this knight will probably give away something. Yeah, rook has no more moves than going back to a2. So this is kind of a very uncomfortable situation, even though white is material up, um, because these, these bishops are gorgeous and supported perfectly. So in this situation, white collapsed and tried to play knight e2 to, to allow knight e4 and, and, and give the exchange back with this move. But after this happens, is g4 or g3 good? Here, uh, maybe it's hard to tell. Doesn't look really, really great. At least black can just save the bishop and and threaten this. So. So it's going to be, <laughs> I mean, it's not like it improves the position. And this is another feature of the bishops. Uh, uh, sometimes, yeah, no, bishop takes a 3 is tricky, Candela, because bishop takes a 3, this check, and the two bishops are hanging. So he probably takes one of them, knight takes a 3 next. It's tricky, but... After we save this and next move we do king g7, the thing is what can white, then we can take. <laughs> so uh, what I was going to say is sometimes you have the bishop pair and you don't need to be scared of moving a bishop back. The bishop usually has moves because it's such a powerful long range piece. You usually have moves to preserve your bishops and, and keep all the pressure. 
So in this case, for example, a move like g3, I think it weakens white's situation and black can just play bishop back and, and keep all the threats. And actually king g7 next move will, will really threaten this knight. <laughs> yeah, all wish you could take your pawn back to g2. Yeah, now the best move is g3 to g2. <laughs> yeah, so in this situation, uh, white being a strong GM decided to play active, give the exchange back, but it was too late. And after these trades, um, the situation is uh, materially is equal, but white is losing. <laughs> so. This is another conversion. Now it's a bishop versus knight, but with queens on the board. Bishop and queen versus knight and queen. Knight and queen, they're a good combination when they are uh, creating some checkmate threats, but with a knight on e1, you're doing quite the opposite to that. Conversely, this bishop is awesome, and these pawns are so weak. So he saved the bishop, good call, and Look how the bishop attacks there, defends here, and the queen attacks here. White is going to lose at least one pawn. And, and with that, the game. And this knight is terrible. So it was a tactical conversion in this case. Yeah, we can fast forward the, the rest of the game, but <laughs> look how precise. Um, so... Queen a6, trying to stop this by attacking the bishop, but queen d1, defending the bishop, attacking the knight, and next move is going to be pawn takes pawn. Game over. So, queen a5, pawn takes pawn. Uh, they played some more moves. a2, knight c2, queen takes knight, and white resigned. But okay, this is out of our topic. Uh, let's go watch Magnus' game versus Dingley Ring then. Uh, I, I didn't see the game, so so it's going to be cool. Can I export this to PGN? Let me see. Yes. Not logged in. No! <laughs> uh, okay, maybe some other time. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> if you pass me a PGN, uh, nice. If not, yeah, let's move on. So let's move to some of my games. And I'm going to start with the last one I played. And it's a horrible game, but it really shows... No, but I guess it's okay because people asked to 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 see some of my games. Uh, if you can give me PGN, we could, we might look have a look at that game later. So the next game I'm gonna show this one, as you can see from the computer analysis here, it wasn't very <laughs> very well played by me. I was white. Um, at some point, I was actually even in trouble. Minus one point six. Um, it was a blitz game, I have to say. Uh, in the in the last tournament I played two months ago, and it was the last game of the tournament. So after defeating an international master, a brilliant uh, miniature with black pieces, I played this game next against a very weak opponent. I don't know, maybe thirteen hundred player, and I played horribly. But. Uh, <laughs> I just had the bishop pair out of the opening. I didn't do absolutely anything during the game. And we get we got to an endgame where I had the bishop pair and he didn't, so I, I won. So yeah, this is very common actually in, in when you see strong player versus weak players, you see this a lot. A strong player does absolutely nothing special, but uh, the opponent uh, does not take the right decisions and eventually gets to a losing position. And that's what happened in this game. So let's see. I'm gonna fast forward until he gave away the bishop pair for some reason. So we're playing a Scandinavian. I'm white. 
queen c7. Yeah, the check on e5 is not supposed to be good. And bishop f5, rook e1, e6, all very standard. And here I played bishop c4 for some reason. I think I, I, I wanted something on e6. So he castled and I played knight h4. So basically it's very common in the Scandinavian that that black loses that bishop for a knight. Sometimes the Scandinavian players we, we play bishop g4 and we trade on f3 at some point. And in other cases you do this with white, knight h4, after playing h3 and I'm gonna collect that bishop. So, so far I can take that bishop already, but for the moment I don't take it because I can take it any moment. So I play a very bad move here <laughs> because of course I had to take it. But I was trying to to do something. Uh, I was trying to induce h6, but the way I did it was very stupid. So I play knight e2. <laughs> hey, the pun's real. You're trying the commands there. Um, knight e7. Ah, I know, I know what I did here. So let's go back here. This was my way of thinking. It would be lovely for me to take... So this is... If I take the bishop, I have the bishop pair, which is, which is good. Good enough. But if I can also have something additional, like ruining his pawn structure, that would be great. So I wanted to play bishop g5 to induce him to play h6. The problem is if I be, if I play bishop f g5 here, I'm threatening to double pawns on f6, so he's not gonna play h6, right? So I played a, <laughs> um, a waiting move, and only after knight bd7 I play bishop g5. As I said, this was a blitz game, so my my strategy was not deep at all. So I play bishop g5 now that I'm not threatening to double pawns, just to induce him to play h6, which he didn't do, of course. Knight d5, which is a good move. And now I decided, all right, all right, I take. So now I have the bishop pair and I have one bishop that is uncontested which is the light square bishop. Is h6 worse than doubling pawns? Uh, not sure if I get your, your what you mean. Uh, thanks for the follow, you dirty nickname. Um, the thing with h6, so I want to induce h6 uh, because then after, for example, bishop takes, because I think what I could do is bishop takes here, I wouldn't have the bishop pair. But what I would have is an amazing strike, pong, I mean, a terrible pawn structure for him after this. Actually, he's losing a pawn immediately. Yeah, and this is, this is terrible. So, yeah, basically when, when you have this situation after knight h4, basically here. Um, if he ever plays h6, when we take the bishop, he has to take with the f-pawn, and that is terrible because the e6 pawn would be, in this case, lost, but in general, a very weak pawn. So h6 is not a move you want to play here. That's why I tried to make moves to induce it, but of course <laughs> he didn't fall for that. Um, anyway, I, I grabbed my bishop pair and what we were saying is I have a light square bishop, he doesn't. So that means that all these pawns in light squares are going to be targets at some point, especially the one that is doubled or the one that is backwards. And of course, if he ever pushes this pawn, then this is going to be the target. Anyway, um, 
of course I cannot exploit my bishop pair yet. Um, black is very solid, but from now on I decided to keep the bishop pair. And I basically did nothing in this game, it was horrible, it was horrible. I did stupid moves like bishop back to d3. Um, here he can, he can just remove my bishop pair and at least I would hope for a bishop versus knight endgame, but he didn't do it. So yeah, I said I was. it was a horrible game. e5 wasn't the best move because of bishop c4. But knight b6 was a good move. And bishop b3 was horrible. How do you know when to go for the targets? When? When they are... Um, basically, when I was talking, for example, that this could be a target, uh, I have no way to attack it right now. <laughs> so... Uh, it's not about when, but when you can reach them, yeah, when they exist. For example, now after e5, it's pretty clear that, that f7 becomes a target. It wasn't before, but when he played e5, I can attack it. So now this is a target. Um, so, yeah, basically you wait. If, if your opponent is solid, uh, I think here black makes a mistake. Although he goes for active play, so it's arguable that he's making a mistake. But from a positional point of view, he's very solid in light squares. He has a dark square bishop. If I was black, I wouldn't touch the structure. E5 is risky in that sense. It gives me light squares lines to attack that he has no bishop to defend. But yeah, arguably he, he wants to get some activity, which makes makes sense for the move and especially after he found this knight b6 move and I went back he could have blocked my bishop maybe not now but um hey RT Tyler what is up actually bishop b3 was a bad move I had to put it on a2 for a reason that we're gonna see in a couple of moves that here after pawn takes my brilliant idea was, because of course I, I gave up that pawn, my brilliant idea was to play queen d3, which is a stupid. I mean, not a stupid, but uh, it was a miscalculation. I did it anyway, because I had nothing better. But um, my idea is a double attack to this pawn and this pawn. So when I played previously um, bishop c4 and I calculated this, I thought I would regain my pawn immediately. The problem, and still keeping the bishop pair. The problem is after his move, which is the obvious, c5, I cannot take on g6 because of c4. <coughs> With my bishop on a2, that would work, queen takes d6, but with my bishop on b3, it doesn't work. So, here I had to say, all right, all right, my mistake, uh, let's find something. And still, c4 is a threat, so I played bishop a2. And fortunately for me, as you can see, by the way, in the diagram here, this is the part of the game where I was in trouble. And he didn't see my threat. Fortunately, he only saw this pawn hanging, so he defended it. But he didn't so he didn't see the g6 pawn hanging, so I was lucky. And he played queen d7, so I took my pawn back. Yay! Anyway, let's move forward. c4, queen h5. I'm doing nothing. Trading, trading, defending. I don't want... I don't have nothing with my queen here. I don't want to trade and, and give up the e-file, so... I go back to defend my rook, but I still keep with the bishop pair. King f8, now I trade, g3, queen e4, good move. <coughs> and now I try to open lines for my terrible bishop on, on a2. 
because this bishop is not so bad, but the, the, the bishop that should help me win is totally trapped here. So I play the obvious, maybe, b3, which is a bad move, but <laughs> from a statistical point of view it's a good attempt. Trying to open this bishop. And now maybe it wasn't easy, especially in a blitz game, to see this, but the best move he had, uh, someone who's playing against the bishop pair, would be to keep this bishop blocked. So the best move would be knight e7. So if I take this pawn, he would block with either bishop or knight on c5. Why is b3 bad? Uh, because of this. <laughs> because of after knight e7, I have, not, I have no way to really open my bishop. If, if I play uh, b4, he just defends this, maybe b5, maybe knight e5, and my bishop is out of, game, out of play. And if I take here, he blocks it with either piece, probably. And my bishop is out of play. So yeah, sometimes for that other stream we are going to do about <laughs> how to play against the bishop pair. When you play against the bishop pair, it's nice if you can kill one of the bishops like this one. Then it's going to be so hard for me to try and, and activate it. And if you put the knight there, I'm never going to go here. So, yeah, I can try some stuff with bishop b1, but... b3 is kind of blitz move. Yeah, it was a blitz game. It was a blitz move. And my opponent didn't find the move. And he went for a, what he thought it was a good idea. But again, the bishops are so powerful when the position gets open that uh, they can fight past pawns, they can fight... Um, they can control a lot of squares, sometimes they kill the rooks. Like, you have rooks, but you have no entry points because of the bishops. And, yeah, knight 5 is a good move as well, Melek. I think knight 5 is it's also a very decent move. I guess I should take anyway. And if you play knight c3, um, I was thinking to defend, but now I'm seeing the problem here. So may maybe, maybe just going for these threats. I don't know. And follow with bishop b3. Yeah, it's a really tough situation, but uh, <coughs> of course. Um, specific calculation is required always, always. Uh, so when, when, when we talk about strategical concepts, we talk about general rules, but they always depend on specific tactics. Um, hello, my name is CJ. Thanks for the follow. <laughs> yes, I read it, Astral. Uh, queen e1, king g2, f6. Yeah. Could be. Could be. Maybe we don't have anything better than start checking. And keep checking. And, oh, you have that. Because this is covered. I have this check, though. And, yeah, it's a mess. Which is at least good for us. <laughs> but, yeah. Sorry to be that person, but what is your rating? I can't see. Uh, no worries, my name is CJ. I have a command for that, at least for my feeder rating. In this case, we're, I'm, I'm showing an over-the-board game, so I don't have the online rating shown <coughs> on the screen. So, yeah, at least that would be a mess, which would be good for me to try and save the, the game, because... Uh, I was in trouble here. I was in trouble. But my opponent didn't take his chances and from a position that was bad for me we went to a, an equal, equal, equalish endgame from the material point of view but I had the bishop pair and that was game over immediately. Hey Rogan, what is up? And he played d3 which he thought it was nice to have a, a passed pawn there, defended, rar. But the problem is, as I said, bishop pair is so strong, they 
they are awesome against isolated pawns, against passed pawns. In this case, the pawn is immediately lost. Even though I lose this one, it's okay. It's gonna be a great endgame. And his knight is bad, yeah. Yeah, of course, you have to use your knight if you don't have the bishop pair. Good quote, Roken. Yeah, that's the quote we need today. The bishop pair is stronger than love. So he played queen e2 for a reason. I don't know what the reason was. And we traded and we went to this endgame. He took here immediately um, uh, regaining the material equality. But then I played bishop e4 and he realized he was in trouble. This endgame is horrible for black now. You need to prove to me that you can win with the bishop pair. Well, this is one example where I basically did nothing in the game. And I show this example because I think it's very common. I think I've won hundreds of games like this one uh, online. Thanks, Chris, for the follow. Um, yeah, just doing nothing, keeping the bishop pair until the end, and this endgame is totally won for white. Although there was a tactical trick that, here that we both missed. It's more than just a bishop pair. Yeah, in this case, it's going to be a pawn as well. That's right, Melek. I've noticed that I have the bishop pair every time I start a game. Doesn't that mean I win? No, Roken, because as we already explained at the beginning of the stream, we call it... We say you have the bishop pair when your opponent doesn't. Not, not when you just have the two bishops. Hey, Bobby. <coughs> so, yeah, the game went on... Uh, he played a5, horrible, um, took on b7, bishop d8 was a good move as well, and a4, I heard the bishop pair is like a pawn advantage, do you think it's more than that? Well, what I've read is they say it's half a pawn, but to be honest, it, it totally depends on the position, it totally, because bishops and knights, which is what they're usually compared to, against, like in this example, there's two bishops against bishop and knight. The bishops and knights are so different between them that sometimes a bishop is much better than a knight and sometimes a knight is much better than a bishop. So it depends a lot on the pawn structure, on the specifics of the, of the position. But yes, usually, usually uh, the bishops are stronger. And if you study endgames, you realize that in, in most theoretical endgames the bishops are stronger than the knights. They help. They defend better against past pawns. They attack pawns better. They coordinate better. <laughs> the queen's pair. Yeah, nice. There are positions... Yeah, Malek is saying. There are positions where rook plus two bishops are better than two rooks uh, plus a knight or two rooks plus a bishop. Yeah. It's not looking good for okay. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, he's playing right now, right? Is he already in the second game? I like knight and bishop because I normally use bishop to be active and the knight to jump over stuff. <laughs> yeah, so you have the two things. Okay, we can... Uh, I attack the knight that is defending the pawn and, and... And here he had a very interesting attempt that he didn't see and I didn't see, of course, which was... Uh, he, he gave the piece. He tried to get some, because if he moves the knight, I take the pawn and it's game over, I will promote. Um, so he decided to give up the piece, which is horrible, because of course the bishops defend all the squares. So nothing, nothing else to see in this game, although he kept playing for some reason. But, but he had a tactical, a tactical idea here, to give up the piece, but in a better way, in a much better way. So... Um, and that's something I already said in another strategy, strategy session. When things are not going strategically well for you, you, you gotta find for tactics. <laughs> tactics can save your day. Uh, nice c4, no, no. The idea is this pawn will never promote here because, you know, bishop e4. <laughs> I mean, your pawn needs three tempi to go there, I have one move to stop it. 
the pong is never gonna promote on b1. The idea is to try and promote the pong on a1. So the move would be bishop e7. And it's important to put it on e7, not in other square, because it's important to have it defended when 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 it goes to this other diagonal. So now after bishop takes a bishop e2 is a good attempt, but I would have check. Bishop e2 would be a good attempt, but I would have takes and check, which is similar to similar to to what I try, right? Similar to the other line. So, hmm. yeah, it's actually the same, the same type of endgame that we have with bishop e7. Uh, because with bishop e7, I take the knight, a3, bishop d4, and bishop f6. This is at least a better attempt because black could actually win. <laughs> For example, if I trade bishops, black wins. So bishop check, bishop e7. If I trade bishops, black wins. So it's basically the same as the line proposed by Bobby. I have to give up the bishop for the pawn. And that will be a opposite color bishop endgame that still still white has um, reason to push. It's two pawns up, one outsider, but yeah, it could be a draw. It could be a draw. Yeah. To be honest, against a 1300, which I think he was, I I would expect to win that. <laughs> you can win the pong. I didn't see. What pong? I would sacrifice the bishop for the pong. Ah yeah, the A pong, yeah. Yeah, by sacrificing the bishop. <laughs> so that would be a four versus two. Chances to draw, but I think I think I should still win. Anyway, that was just a horrible game, but I wanted to show it because, yeah, sometimes you just keep the bishop pair until the end, and eventually the opponent didn't get anything. You you have a good endgame. Anyway, let's let's look at some uh, more interesting example. Uh, He's at eleven hundred. Uh, no challenges now, Angerta. Sorry, I think he played outstanding for his rating. Uh, I don't have his rating, but okay, I believe you. Although this was a blitz game, so maybe the rating is not the same. Um, anyway, I'm trying to pick a game that could be interesting. Uh, there's one game I wanted to show. Let's go there because I was impressed specifically at um, at some point. Um, this was a game between Gatakamsky and, and Vladimir Kramnik. And uh, I, again, I'm gonna fast forward the opening. Uh, it's a Sicilian, so it's it's complex. Are there any bishop? Pair miniatures under 30 moves? I don't know, probably. I don't know all the bishop pair games in the world. Okay, castle long, going for a crazy game. And uh, yeah, so far so good until we reach to a point here, I think. Yeah. So here Kamsky decides to take on f6. Um, giving up the bishop pair for uh, the pawn structure, basically. So, again, in this case, it's not uh, as easy as uh, one side has the bishop pair and the other doesn't. There are other strategical factors in play. So when you give bishop pair for two double pawns, you usually isolate another pawn. Um, but also this pawn structure is not so bad, especially if you keep the king here in the center, it's going to be a good shelter. The pawns also help control in the center. Um, 
even though this is weak and these are weak or at least um, clumsy it also means that you are opening lines so good things and bad things about both the pawn structure and having the bishop pair which we didn't talk yet what does black have now that he has the bishop pair what is good of this for nothing because black gets g file and h6 c1 diagonal so i feel like he didn't get anything well cranny thought sorry kamsky thought he had something and it's white to play in this position so so let's move on and, and see what what kamsky did kamsky play 94 and he's saying no no you're not gonna have the h61 diagonal because I'm hitting f6 now and if you defend it with that move I'm gonna play 96 check and if you don't give away the bishop pair again uh, back I'm gonna take on f7 winning a pawn and then I'll return to d6 probably you follow the idea the king is overloaded overworked defending the bishop on d7 and the pawn on f7 maybe he got hypnotized by Mikhail Tal which secretly was stancing behind crying <laughs> yeah and if bishop g7 he can probably do the same knight e6 check knight takes f7 so So look at this position and I was so impressed by by this move that Kramnik did now just king e7 though well king e7 I can take on f6 tactics tactics <laughs> can he play bishop c8 uh, he can, but then I take with check on f6. So, Kraunik played the move that Grufo is saying, and I was so impressed when I saw it because, um, <laughs> hey, nobody, yes. Yes, the black player was Kramnik. And Kramnik is such an excellent uh, positional player. So, what's the thing here? When you have the bishop pair, what are you looking for? Activity of the bishops? Which in this case, you know, the position is quite open. So the bishops are going to be great. Uh, but you cannot start putting your pieces passively or even even allowing stuff like 96 knight takes f7 and giving the bishop pair back so you don't mind uh, being a pawn down you play active so bishop c6 was played and it's actually the best move according to the engine and okay knight takes f6 obviously king e7 only move now the knight is attacked and I guess Kamsky uh, had this figured out and he thought I'm fine because I managed to put my knight on, on h5 blocking that isolated pawn you're never gonna develop your dark square bishop now I'm controlling g7 if your king ever goes back because it has no other squares if the king ever goes back to develop the bishop I go and check again so maybe that was Kamsky's idea right now how do we develop this bishop and i loved how how kramnik played this uh, i don't i don't know the game is let me see from 1996 it was a long time ago i don't know what the time control was i don't know whether kramnik play, played this blitzing out the moves f6 is an idea f6 with how does that help the f8 bishop ah to play king f7 could be could be an idea but it's not what he played 
he played more active with the pieces. Something they, they do a lot, the grand, grandmasters, you know, they, they keep the structure and they find the good way to activate the pieces with that pawn structure. They don't create more weaknesses. So instead of f6, um, black did the plan that nobody is, is saying in the chat, rook g8, rook g5. Harassing this knight so he can finally develop the bishop and then h5, exactly. So, rook g8, and you go immediately for that. Look how he, he goes to solve the, the crucial problem. He doesn't go, I don't know, oh, let's go attack when I have a problem with developing this bishop. No, no, no. Let's fix the, the problem with the bishop because I have the bishop pair. I need to use it. Okay. So, Kamsky blocks the diagonal of that bishop on c6. It also kills a bit his own bishop. Rook g5. Knight had to move. Look how g4 is never an option. Not here, because of course f3 is hanging. But even if the pawn was back on f2, it wouldn't be an option because the rook would be hanging. So, so this bishop is actually helping this plan of rook g8, rook g5, because the knight cannot be defended. Um, if with the pawn back, you played bishop e2, then you would hang g2. So this, this bishop is actually helping a lot to develop the other bishop in a way, because the knight cannot stand on, on h5. So the knight has to move, and now h5. Uh, White is Gatakamski. I don't know if you can see it on the screen. I thought you could. White was Gatakamski. And yeah, h5. We don't... I feel like black will win the game. Yeah. <laughs> um, now the bishop can not only go to g7, also to h6. So maximizing uh, the squares the bishops can go to. So remember these ideas. Don't... If you have bishop pair, look for diagonals, look to open lines, even if you have to give up pawns, activate your pieces. Anyway, this position is, according to the engine, minus 0 0.6. Still not a, bit, a big advantage, but now from this point on, as you can see here in the, in the computer analysis diagram, it goes slowly, 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 black, 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 black. All in black's favor, as is normal because black is Vladimir Kramnik. So, h4, hitting the rook, the rook had to move. I'm also blind and I didn't see the 0-1, so I am the best to call the result if he actually wins. <laughs> Is this from a book? No, I just picked some random games where I saw the bishop pair theme. I could have picked some other games. Okay, at least Kamsky is using the knight, not unlike my previous opponent in the game that I showed. Um, bishop h6, king has to move. And now the rook enters e3. Um, rook e1. I'm not sure if I would do that because that rook is funny on e3, but I guess, okay. I didn't analyze this game, so I'm probably missing some, some points. Rook g8 now, putting more pressure on the weaknesses. And look how Kramnik has all the four pieces active. The two bishops and the two rooks. Why? <laughs> Kamsky has some problem with with some of his pieces. Even though white is upon up. So he trades rooks. What else? And plays c3, only way to to incorporate the king, right? Um, f5. Rawr. And a common theme I, I heard a lot. Uh, is that I'm not sure of course any any general rule doesn't apply always but some things I heard to some masters when you have the bishop pair and your opponent has in this case a light square bishop you put your pawns in light squares so they restrict your opponent's bishop um, I heard that a lot so in this case Kramnik is doing perfectly according to that rule 
even though I think it's not always the case that you, you do that. Um, and sometimes I like to think in chess. I think every every time I do a strategy session, I do this. I say this. <laughs> I like to think in chess not like A causes B, but A goes well with B. So sometimes you have the bishop pair, and because of that, you take some statistical decisions like putting the pawns in some squares. And some other times you have the pawns in those squares, then you decide to grab the bishop pair. So it's not always that one thing implies another. It's just things that go together well you you try to look them look to look for them anyway um let's keep looking at the game kamski activates his king i love suk Suan endgames where i get to give the suk Suans to my opponent oh this one game i think it's the bot winning game or the geller game where the two bishops uh put two knights in suk Suan. <laughs> Restricting opponent's bishop is mostly more important than safe pawns. Uh, thanks for the thanks for the point there, nobody. And everyone, <laughs> um, look at what nobody says in the chat because he's much stronger than me. So everything that he says <laughs> is gonna be a good tip. Okay. Um, Let's fast forward a bit. F4. Okay, that pawn is is not restricting the opponent's bishop anymore, but I guess Kramnik is not uh, not concerned a lot at all about this diagonal to be used by this bishop. Mm. But more importantly, he's he's definitely restricting this this pawn structure. And this rook now. So look at these pieces. They're horrible. <laughs> They're horrible. So king cd1. Yeah, I was going to say I would love to have my king on e2 to be able to play g3, but not even sure if that's an option. But he tries. He tries. e5, king e2. Ah, uh, the bishop hits the rook before he can go g3. Such a nasty player, Vladimir. Rook h1, bishop f5. Ugh. <laughs> yeah. I feel like this is not Sukson directly, but you force him to do only some moves. Yeah. Look, this is complete. Okay, I wouldn't say complete domination, but I would resign here. <laughs> this is so uncomfortable for white. So he goes back with the king to c2. Now the knight is pinned. And e4. Finally opening more lines. Now these two pieces are tight. I'm sure Pepe wouldn't resign here. <laughs> Thanks, nobody. <laughs> against Kramnik? Maybe, maybe. Well, actually, if I'm playing against Kramnik, maybe I. I see how, how many moves do I last. <laughs> okay, so these two pieces are now tied. Totally passive. Uh, but this is also hitting this, so... Oof that. If I was, like, standing next to the board while they played, I would think what happened to Gata. I mean, his position looks like I played versus Kramnik. <laughs> but Gata had some games like this where he successfully managed to to get a draw or a win so yeah sometimes he has shitty positions and makes something out of them but yeah against Kramnik you, you cannot do that Infernal Kash thanks for the follow suddenly he would drop a knight on the board he brought from home <laughs> okay b3 looks like a random move because he's running out of moves <laughs> now a3 b4 bam let's open up that king now <laughs> now that we have the three pieces ready to attack the king and these are guys are not helping take 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 rook c8 check Ugh. king b2 bishop d4 check 
Team B1. He's not resigning. <coughs> Rook A8. King C1. Two files actually. <laughs> Two files are open now. Threatening rook takes d3. The knight is pinned. He cannot prevent it. But instead of rook takes d3, he does a better move. Although the engine liked rook f2. But yeah, rook f2 threatening rook takes bishop. That, that would be a good one. But rook d1, anyway, good move. King c2 and rook c1. Oh, snap. Oh, look at that move. And only when the king is not defending the knight, bishop takes. Well, that's game over. Not for Kamsky. Kamsky keeps e6. Rawr. <laughs> okay. b7. Rawr. Bishop d4 check. King a3. Bishop b5. And now he resigned. Because he realized after the rook trade, black has the bishop pair, so he resigned. So close, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's move to one game, to this game from great players to one of my games. So I'm gonna show. Um, yeah, again, I don't have a game where it's clearly bishop per the topic, but let's pick one when, when my opponent gave it away for some reason. So, let's show this game. Let's go with Magnus' game. Oh, I think you pasted the PGN in the chat, maybe? I don't know, maybe maybe next time, but like I, I, I have it um, prepared. Yeah, I followed that link, but I couldn't copy the... It asked me to, to log in. Okay, I'm going to try later. I'm opening the link and I'll try later. Let's now watch one of my games. Um, so I was black here against a uh, player. <laughs> uh, this is from the Galician Team League. Let's move. So this is classical chess over the board. I played this game um, four, four years ago, I think, or less. Let me check. It was only two years ago, okay. But it was in my previous team. So that's what I thought it was uh, much before. Um, so this was my last year in that team. Anyway, um, when I played this game, hey, Sphinxy. Uh, so this is a game where I had the bishop pair, basically. It wasn't entirely the only theme in the in the game, but okay, it was definitely one of the strategical themes. And this link is PGN directly. Oh, thank you, Hypo Defense. Thank you. Thank you for that. Then I can, I can see it later. Okay, so after after this game, we're gonna go to Magnus's game. Uh, let's first look at this game because um, this is funny, story time. But I'm not gonna bore you a lot. I'm gonna just take a minute. Uh, exactly safely, only one inaccuracy. That's what I was going to say. Um, when I played this game, I was like, I. I finished the game and I was like, okay, that was a good job. I mean, it was a good job. I put a lot of effort on the game and I felt like it was nothing special, the game. I just calculated, played what I thought were the best moves. Next day, I analyzed it as usually. I made my annotations. I, I thought, oh, I played good moves according to the engine. That's good. Um, and then years later, like two years later, basically this year I looked at the game and I thought hey man this is my best game ever <laughs> so 
And I was actually looking at my comments that I did the next day of what I thought during the game. And I said, man, the things I'm trying to teach my students, they are in this game. Uh, so I used this game I used this game this year at the chess school uh, several times. Um, but yeah, it happens to feature the two bishops thing. Still, I think I committed some mistakes. I don't understand why the analysis says only one inaccuracy because there's one point that uh, my calculation was a little bit iffy, but I played well anyway. So let's go to the game. Uh, I played Sicilian with black, which also, by the way, one inaccuracy, 12 average centipon loss. I wouldn't expect that playing Sicilian with black, but okay. You gotta do a deeper analysis, maybe. Yeah. Um, and my opponent plays the Alaping. Do you have some tips on analyzing your own games? Um, well, I guess every player is different, not just the, the level, but also what they like to analyze or what they like to play. So it would be hard for me to to give specific tips, but there's one that I can say: analyze it as soon as possible, because I think, especially at low levels like like mine or less, um, you don't expect to play like an engine. So more importantly, that what an engine can say about the game is what you were thinking during the game. So therefore, I think it's a uh, very good advice to analyze the games as soon as possible after you play the game. I, with, with classical chess games, which is this one, for example, the game maybe took four hours, I like to analyze the next day. Um, because the, the day of the game, I usually, I'm usually tired, I want to have dinner or take a beer or something, but the next day I, I analyze the game. And when I analyze, when I analyze it, I try to in the important decisions, like for example, bishop takes knight. <laughs> when I take a decision like that, I, I try to write down what was I thinking, why did I decide that. And actually, two years later, I I, <laughs> I read what I what I was thinking in this game, and I said, oh man, that that was the perfect game. I took the right decisions every time. The reason why you play accurate against weak opponents is because they blunder or play bad move and you only have some moves that give you advantage. Is that over the board game? Yes, it was an over the board game that I played two, two years ago. And if you know me, I never played the Sicilian. So I don't even know why did I play the Sicilian. But I have the, my comments here. Yeah, I have my comments here in, in perfect Spanish. So I, <laughs> this is what I wrote two years ago. I didn't remember the repertoire of this opponent, but I remembered that we played Scandinavian in another game, so I decided to, to get away from that in case he, he was uh, prepared. <laughs> in, in Spanish, no. Thank you, we'll keep this in mind. Cool. I hate when you're black and your opponent tried to play draw opening. That's difficult. Chess is Chess is too complex. Uh, well, yeah, some of you said d5 here. There are two lines here, d5 and knight f6. Two main lines. Uh, thankfully, I played the Alapin with, with, with white, so I had an idea or two. And <laughs> I took two minutes to decide this. I have this annotation here. Um, because um, I usually have more problems to play against d5. And my annotation is, is curious. <laughs> my annotation is, is really nice. Because why did I take the, the right decision every time in this, in this game? So my annotation says, uh, I was fighting internally <laughs> between knight of 6 and d5. Because as white, uh, it's usually more uh, difficult for me to play against d5. But I thought that if it's difficult, the variant with white, it, it should be also with black, <laughs> with the black side. So I decided to go for knight f6, which is probably easier for me to understand. Okay, so e5, knight e5, all this is main theory. Takes, takes. And here I play d6, yeah. 
Magnus disagrees with you, Melek. Melek says, I play knight f6 here and I think it's equalizing easily. Easily? Hmm. <laughs> And, and this is another important moment, bishop c4. And it's one of the <coughs> one of the things I, I try to teach to my students when I teach them about when to think, when not to think in during a chess game, when to calculate, when not to calculate, when when to be practical e6 or knight b6 is saying infernal clash yeah at this point i thought knight b6 should be the move and after the game i realized uh, i looked in the database knight b6 is by far the main option here but i didn't remember or let's put it this way i never played this with white so i didn't know this line specifically in this move order hey quartillo thanks you're taking notes nice well done so, <coughs> so here I said, okay, knight b6 must be the move, but I'm playing uh, a classical chess game, so I have time to think. So let's think for a minute. Is there any problem with knight b6? And then I discovered, let's, let's show this line very briefly, because this is not the topic we're trying to cover today. Uh, but I thought, if there's any problem, if, the, if there's a problem, it has to be related to this move bishop takes f7 and okay I'm not going to go too deep with this bishop takes f7 is a bad move sort of a bad move but I got too scared actually um, the evaluation of the engine is minus 0 0.53 which you know to give a piece for that is not a bad situation um, so I was I was calculating this over the board because I thought, okay, if I hit the bishop, the only problem I could possibly have is bishop takes f7. So let's calculate this. And I spent like two minutes and I saw that after e6, he had knight g5, but then I was calculating, hmm, knight g5, uh, but I'm fine. And then I said, oh, but e6 instead of, <laughs> instead of knight g5. And then I have to take it. I have to take it. And then he has knight g5 or even d5. And yeah, engine likes black, but I didn't like this when I saw. So I decided to be practical. I didn't spend more than two minutes on this. I said, okay, I don't like this. I don't know. It looks like it should be good for me because I'm a piece up and it, I seem to survive. But I don't like that. So I was practical. And even though knight b6 is the main move here, I decided let's play e6. And that was a very practical choice. Uh, knight b6 is the kind of move that you play if you know it. I mean, <coughs> not knight b6, but specifically allowing bishop takes f7 is something you do if you know it. If you don't know it, ah. Uh. <laughs> and this was a good finding. We talk about this, uh, I talked with my opponent after the game about this, and he said, bishop takes f7, what? <laughs> Actually, there are only a few games in the database with bishop takes f7. But then, because I analyzed it, uh, the next game I played the Alapin against a strong player, I think it was an international master, I played bishop takes f7 <laughs> and I destroyed him because I, I had some ideas of attacking there. When did knight c6 happen? When I played it in the opening. So, so yeah, bishop takes f7 is not a good move against knight b6, but it's really, really dangerous for black. Uh, so I played e6. On move, okay, let's go back. On move 4, after knight 3 Topalov played bishop takes f7. Yeah, there are some, some games in the database. Anyway, let's move forward to the to the bishop pair thingy. I hope Ingol is still here. <laughs> <coughs> so in this position, my opponent took a very, very, very committal decision here very very committal uh, I wasn't sure why he did it and I think he he couldn't explain it after the game you're still here okay cool yes infernal clash uh, clash or cash cash infernal cash yes he 
took on d5. Seems incorrect, exactly. He took on d5. The engine doesn't like it. Uh, it says position is equal anyway, but from a strategical point of view, I always tell my students, if you're gonna give something, in this case the bishop pair, let it be for a reason. <laughs> I think there's no reason to do it here. I, I don't see what what uh, white gains with this. So, so yeah, now we're in the topic of our, of our session. Because now I have the bishop pair. Bishop takes d5 and you say thanks for the bishop pair. Exactly, that's what I thought during the game. According to my notes. <laughs> I think he had an idea, but it was the wrong idea. Because he continued very fast, very fast, he did pawn takes d6. Which I think is also a bad move. Yeah, I was very happy to see this. And I think actually black is now... Uh, for choice after these two moves. So basically he gave away two strategical advantages in these two moves. One is the bishop pair and what's the other, guys? What's the other advantage he had and he's giving away with this e takes d6? <laughs> Respect the bishops. The space, exactly the space. He had the space with the pawn e5. He had the space. Now, after this, no space. We're equal. Double isolated pawns. Ah, you mean these pawns. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you... In... Uh, yeah, I could have taken. That's right, Ingol. Um, so it's not as important. And also, as we mentioned, sometimes for the bishop pair, having double pawns is, is a good price because then you have open lines for the bishops but but yeah he had he had the space here now he doesn't <coughs> so basically now if you look at the structure of the pawn structure it's totally totally completely symmetrical so we're Absolutely e symmetrical, absolutely equal from a uh, material point of view, structural point of view, but I have the bishop pair and, and white doesn't. Okay, um, we can argue that it's white to move and I still didn't castle, so white has a small, very tiny lead in development, maybe, but it's not enough. I'm gonna castle anyway, so, so it's just a position that it's everything equal except I have the bishop pair and he doesn't. So I thought it was, this was a cool game to show uh, because of that. Mm, maybe it's, <laughs> it's a position where the theme is clean? I don't know. Like there's no other imbalance in the position. But there was an imbalance and he just gave it away. Um, plus it makes the bishops stronger, yeah. If you keep opening lines, it makes the bishops stronger, that's right. Wrestling, thanks for the follow. 95 here, uh, yeah, it could be a move. I don't have any notes on that move. I have the note that I expected knight c3 or rookie one here, uh, develop developing moves. If bishop g5, you play f6 or take g5. Um, if bishop g5 here, hmm. I think if I trade, I might win something. Maybe, maybe not. Because I'm still not castled. So maybe I just castle and threaten to win something. Or trade and castle, I don't know. Uh, thanks for the challenge, but I don't play unlimited, sorry. Do you like playing with Isolani or against it? I like playing with it. But I sometimes like to play against it. I don't know. It depends. <laughs> I like to attack, so I, I like to play with it. 
but sometimes against weak players I like to play against it because endgames are easy. Um, anyway, my opponent played h3. I think I'm gonna... Uh, or maybe not. I was thinking about fast forwarding a bit. Uh, the game was really long. Uh, I just had some patience here and he did. The game was equalish. a6 wasn't a good move apparently. Um, Except I had the bishop pair. <laughs> that was the only. Difference. <clears throat> the only unbalance, actually. Yeah, if someone has any questions specifically, I might or might not answer them. Um, yeah, here the, he, this, this was a, a decision I, I had to make as well. B takes C6 was also a very interesting move. Uh, but I, <laughs> I have the notes here saying I wanted to play for two results. Uh, good night, Bazinga. This was an important match for, for our team. So I didn't want to, to take a lot of risks. And I didn't want to create more imbalances because I have an advantage. Even if it's the tiniest of the advantages, I have the bishop pair. Um, so I thought, let's keep everything, <laughs> everything else equal. Oh wait, he wants to get to the bishop pair position. What? I'm going to dinner. Okay, see you later, Tenta. Oh, thanks. I hope it is. Whereas B takes C6, maybe C6 is weak. Yeah, 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 C6 is weak. Um, I mean, D5 is weak, D4 is weak. Uh, it's just a change of a structure. A6 would be weak also, not only C6, but also A6. But the point is I'm gonna follow up with C5. Not too much analysis on single moves. Uh, okay. I hate that when you are in a somewhat lost position, the best move is to trade queens, for example, but then you would just lose easily and you'd rather hope for small chances, but engine doesn't like it and decrease your accuracy. Yeah, in, in, in human play, you better not go for a clearly losing endgame, even if it's the best choice by the engine. So yeah, I keep moving. I'm just saying in this game I was being practical, so the same I uh, I avoided the dangerous line in the opening, which is it, it was a good learning for me because in the past I would have spent like 30 minutes trying to make <laughs> the bishop takes f7 line work, and then after knight b6 my opponent wouldn't play bishop takes f7 of course, and I would be with 30 minutes less in the clock. So yeah, even. So I was practical there, and I was practical here in this decision. I'm gonna keep everything equalish, except I have the bishop pair and my opponent doesn't. And now look at this. Now I can really use the the light squares. Finally, after queen b3, queen c4, offering a queen trade that would be great for me. And uh, and this would be weak. I don't really like accuracy because it can sometimes lie to you telling you played a good game when the opposite happened and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why even though I analyzed this game the next day with, with the engine and the engine said, good job, as it's saying now, I didn't think it was a great game until I saw it two years later and I, I said, okay, it's my best game. But not because the, the the moves were spectacular or something, just because my decisions were right, <laughs> at least according to my level. I was practical in the moments I had to be practical, and and then I had the time to think in the moments that I had to think that is going to happen very soon. I had to calculate a lot. So, so yeah, I offered that queen trade that was good for me, so he avoided and keep, kept the knight defended. I kept putting pressure on the weaknesses. The best games are often boring, <laughs> yeah. Queen d2, bring the rook. So my pieces start getting active. I'm sort of threatening stuff, 
uh, he counterattacks to my queen, queen goes to c4, <coughs> and again, because he doesn't have a light square bishop, um, I can use the light squares to 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 invade with my with my pieces a bit. So my queen is safe there. It wouldn't be if if he had a light square bishop. Bishop b3. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, queen c4 puts pressure on this weakness. So he has to defend it. Now I'm coordinated against a light square that he cannot defend with a bishop. So the knight cannot go there. So I'm basically forcing bishop e3, which is such an awful move. This is the, the worst bishop ever now. So it's uh, <laughs> respecting the difference, because it's a big difference, uh, what Kramnik did in his game. Um, I'm going to get your pieces more and more passive by using my, my activity. So yeah, thanks to the activity of my pieces, I'm, I'm putting his pieces in, in passive squares. Um, of course, there's a big difference <laughs> from what Kramnik did to, to Kamsky and this. But still, this is um, nice for black. Looking at ending evaluation while preparing opening line isn't the best. Yeah. Yeah. For example, if you look at the engine evaluation, you would never find the bishop takes f7 line in, in that opening with... And I think it's a very, very good one for blitz. <laughs> or at least you should open your your range a little. I used to, to do something that I'm totally sure that Jobaba does, which is pick tricky lines that give minus one for you. <laughs> Like, okay, minus one is not terrible enough. So I would accept minus one as a good opening for me if it's tricky. Okay, so rook c1, queen goes to b3. I have all the light squares there for me. Yeah, now this was an important moment. Uh, it's best not to risk in chess, I guess. Not really often it pays off. Yeah, at some point if you want to win, you have to risk. And here comes the moment. Um, I like to... I like to think, and I tell that to my students, that there are some moments where you need to stop and think and calculate. And some others... I mean, you need to smell it. You need to smell it. Sometimes uh, you can play just practical moves, not to spend a lot of time, just risk-free moves, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and sometimes you need to smell that something's going on and you need to to work hard. And that's what I did in this position. Uh, in the opening, I, I took a very practical decision because why would I spend 30 minutes calculating a line that may not happen? That's impractical. But now after queen d1, I better calculate what's going on here. Because my opponent is giving up this b2 pawn to take on d5. Or offering a queen trade that will maybe alleviate him or maybe not. So I have a, a decision to make here and I need to calculate. It's not as easy as, okay, let's take a practical decision now. If any, the practical decision would be to trade queens and go for an for a very equalish endgame where I still have the bishop pair. But then I will have to, to get one piece passive to defend uh, d5. And he's gonna have the c5 for the rook eventually or not. Well, uh, maybe not. <laughs> um, you don't instantly queen trade and win with the bishop pair? <laughs> Weak. That would be a good try, but I don't think you know, if it's bishop pair, if the rooks were not on the board, maybe. <laughs> hey, John John. But with rooks on the board and two open lines, I assume he's going to have enough counterplay. Because even if I use one of the lines, he's going to have the other. Um, and we both of us have weak pawns, so he's probably going to have counterplay. <coughs> so... His bishop is sad. Yeah, his bishop is sad. So, yeah, 
in the opening I, I took a very practical choice of not calculating deeply a line that may not happen which by the way is something that I learned the hard way uh, I played I think it was five years ago against an international master in a classical chess game in a tournament and I had a similar situation to this one with the bishop takes f7 in the opening I had a move that I thought it was cool but it allowed a trick in that case was a knight g6 hitting rook discovered against my queen something like that and I said okay I'm gonna calculate if it if it works or not and I spent 25 minutes maybe to decide that I had enough against the trick so I played my move after 25 minutes of thought and my opponent didn't even <laughs> didn't even think he, he came to the board because of course he was walking around he came to the board he saw that <laughs> I allowed a trick of course it, I'm sure he saw the trick but he was like oh you spent 25 minutes I'm not even gonna consider playing the trick he played another move, a developing move, normal, practical move. And I was like, oh, oh, now I have 25 less minutes in my clock and everything I calculated is useless in this position. And I learned that the hard way. <laughs> yeah. So in this game, I took, I think, the right choice from a practical point of view. In the opening, it's not worth it to... to calculate something that you know it's not gonna kill you if, if you calculate it bad so queen b2 knight d5 bishop d8 says nobody yeah that's actually the best line so here i calculated a lot and there's some inaccuracies in my in my calculation because we both missed a couple of moves during the line but mostly my line mostly worked yeah, so after calculate, I think I spent like 20 minutes here <coughs> and I decided to go for the win with queen takes b2. Theme ch guy, thanks for the follow. And a funny thing that happened in this game is that actually the, the, final, the final checkmate is very beautiful because I used my two bishops, which is good for our topic. Um, yeah, knight takes d5 was played and of course I wanted to preserve this bishop who's going to be key to 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 kill to kill him there's one idea here that's going to be important at some point which is rook takes e3 um, but so here i was debating uh, between bishop d8 and bishop h4 and it turns out that bishop d8 is more precise than what i did i did bishop h4 yeah kill him sounds so brutal <laughs> Yeah, bishop d8 was more precise because it prevents the counterplay with rook c7 amongst other things but I calculated that counterplay and I wanted to allow it actually bishop h4 is not the best but not because of rook c7 but because of rook c5 exclam which we both missed how do you decide to sack exchange? well in this case I decided for a very particular reason I want to kill him <laughs> so I want to remove the defender of f2 um, yeah and here I calculated the line with g3 I have a lot of lines here I have the rook c5 in comments I have the rook c5 line which was the best and uh, what he played which is rook c7 which is not as good so here I played the obvious rook takes e3 and I have a lot of attack um, can't we just go with boop him instead? Sounds more kid friendly. Okay, okay. So here I I, <laughs> I went on to boop him. F takes e4 and bishop e4. Uh, well, f takes is gonna happen. Yes. Bishop e4 is gonna happen, but first, yes, exactly, Grufo. First, queen f2. First, I, I bring my pieces uh, to prepare for the um, for the ideas with bishop g3, etc. But or even queen g3, queen takes h3. Uh, the thing is, here, first of all, he cannot take with the knight because then queen takes f2 wins the knight, and then I would have 
the two bishops versus the rook, which is the bishop pair against one rook. That's that's an immediate win. So he takes with the pawn not to lose all the material. Um, queen f2, king h1, bishop e4. And here he played the human move, which I think is the best one. So I think you all would play that. Knight f4 forced, yeah. There was, of course, queen g1 as well, but again, an endgame where I have two bishops versus a rook should be winning. <coughs> so yeah, knight f4 forced. And here, this is actually the move that was uh, more difficult for me to find from afar when I was calculating back when I was deciding queen takes b2 or, or, or trading queens. Hey, Altulu, thanks for the follow. Resign coming. Well, the position is still minus one, but it's very dangerous for him. Um, G5. No, G5 is not the move here. Queen takes e3 seems great. Just queen takes e3. Yes, queen takes e3. <coughs> so, when I'm calculating whether queen takes b2 is good or not for me, uh, or should I go for the queen trade, um, <laughs> I calculated, you know, the, line were, the lines were more or less forced. I was calculating all the lines, not only this one, of course, because he could play g3 or other moves. But, but here, I, uh, uh, for quite a while, I was thinking, and I don't have anything that works here. Until I saw, why don't I just take the pawn? <laughs> I'm actually threatening stuff. Queen c1 is the best move here. He didn't play it. He collapsed here. He collapsed. Why not bishop g3? I'm sure I was calculating bishop g3. Um, don't I have a line here? No, I didn't take note on, on bishop g3. Uh, queen e2 maybe? Maybe queen e2? I can't remember what I calculated. Queen e2 maybe bishop g2. Ah, queen e2 bishop g2, yeah. <coughs> queen g1 then. Then queen g1. <coughs> what do you play after queen c1? Uh, so queen takes e3. After queen c1, I would play. This wasn't played, <laughs> by the way. I would play queen f2, threatening bishop g3. That was the idea. And then what we saw, I have the line here because we saw it after the game, uh, that he had this resource of rook takes f7. Uh, yes, exactly, nobody. Rook takes f7. Bishop takes d2, knight takes, king takes, and he can trade, probably. And he has a lot of chances to draw here. Even though, yeah, I, I have a long line here <laughs> that we saw, but yeah, he has a lot of chances to draw, although still a pawn up for black. So this was his best chance, definitely. This was his best chance, but he missed it. It's not easy to see. I think we both missed rook takes f7 in the game. So he played a move that looked logical, but it's a blunder and so it yeah, he collapsed at this point. Probably still losing. Yeah, yeah, actually I have a long line here in the analysis that shows that my king is actually safer than his. So so it's not like he has a perpetual. So yeah, it should be still losing, but a lot of work is required there. Queen e2. Well, queen e2 loses the knight, doesn't it? Queen and it should win. Yeah, but at least uh, I, I should have to work more. Queen e2. Uh, queen e2 I take the knight, right? Analysis graph says he's okay, no? No, analysis graph which is here, we're here, and after his next move, he's in minus eight. So, we're the dot, yes. 
<coughs> yeah, so he made a blunder, but it was a human move. He played queen g4, which thankfully allowed a very beautiful um, finish of the game. Yeah, he didn't play queen c1. Um, so he played queen g4, defending the knight, trying to attack, keeping this defended. The rook keeps this defended, so it's not like I have uh, checked there. Um, the queen defends g3, so it, it stops the threat of queen e1, bishop g3. But it allows bishop g3. And it's funny that I, w I, I had calculated this. Uh, when I was deciding to to take on b2, this line I, I had calculated. I didn't see queen c1 though, at that moment. I saw it later. Um, bishop g3 hits everything. Yes, that's what I did. Bishop g3 hitting everything, and the check has no use. Look at how how beautifully my my two bishops work now threatening all sorts of things and stopping any 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 checks I mean after this check I go here nothing for him <coughs> so bishop g3 and now he played a move that hang checkmate but but he was lost anyway best move was queen e2 here which I don't know I take the knight <coughs> but he played 92 no he played the check first sorry and then 92 And he says, oh yes, I'm stopping this, I'm stopping that. And now it's mating too, guys. So it's nice because I, I use my, my two bishops for the checkmate. So it goes with the topic. Look how active my bishops are. What's the reputation of queen e1 and bishop f2 instead of bishop g3? Let's put it on the board. Uh, instead of bishop g3, queen e1, and bishop f2, knight e2, I guess. Oh, yes, it's mate in 3. Sorry, guys, it's mate in 3, not in 2. <laughs> yes, it's in 3. Sorry, sorry. Maybe knight two. Still queen of no. Mm. Knight two hitting my bishop. Yeah, but bishop g three is so annoying. Um. So yes, he played knight two, and after bishop takes d two, he resigned. Bishop d3 is still winning. Well, he plays rook c8, rook e8 maybe. And defends the knight. Ah no, I can take the knight anyway. Oh. How to get better at chess? Um, I think I have a command for that. But I can never remember the, the name of the command. Give me a second. Uh... How to get... Hmm. What was the command, guys? Someone remembers the command to get bad at chess? Okay, so that was it. Let's go watch Magnus's game. Let's, let's watch a, a high-quality game instead of my, my shitty play. Oh, get better. There you go. It's get bad, the command. That's the one. <laughs> so the mech guy just do the opposite to to what Getbat says. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, let's go watch Magnus game, copy. Um, so, Ingol, how is how is this session going? Do you do you want to to discuss anything specifically instead of watching games? <coughs> Good game, by the way. Thanks, nobody. Um, did the import work? Yes, Dingerin versus Magnus Carlsen. How to force show some Carlsen as kid games? <laughs> How to force myself to calculate deeper? Uh, just do it. When I do tactics, I let's let's hit this just so that we have it because I have this layout so. <coughs> I think a lot keep going, it's very instructive. Nice. Um, I mean, it's really hard to separate Bishop Pair from the rest of things that are happening in a game. Um, how to force myself to calculate deeper? Yeah, trying to answer that. Um, I don't know, man, just do it. Uh, you're not in a rush. Don't do puzzle rush. <laughs> don't do puzzle rush. And that's it. Just take your time. If you uh, if you have a puzzle, let let your goal be to solve it, not to solve it fast. That's that's my way. Uh, maybe there are other ways to force you to calculate deeper, but that's my way. Uh, when I do puzzles, my main goal is to solve them, even if it takes two hours. If it takes two hours, okay. If I'm too tired and I cannot solve it, okay, tomorrow it's another day, but um, yeah, focusing on on finding the moves, the ideas, discovering them, um, I guess re reinforces, no, uh, it um, builds those um, I'm lacking vocabulary for this. <laughs> it builds those um, tools in your brain instead of doing puzzle rush or stuff like that that only makes you be more and more lazy. But I want to improve in bullet, <laughs> then play bullet. Neuro connections. Yeah, I, I wanted to say something more poetic than <laughs> less technical, but okay, that, that that works. Thanks. Someone said the biggest difference between GM and a regular passer in calculations is not what GM calculate that passer don't, but the opposite. Yeah, I think it's the opposite. When I mm, we were discussing the other day, Quartillo and me, that when I play against a GM, um, most of the things I calculate. He, he, he don't even consider it. It's like, <laughs> why would I calculate that? That's stupid. So it's not that they calculate more and deeper, although they can, but that they narrow a lot more the options. They, they have better intuition, better uh, knowledge, and better heuristics. They consider first the moves that tend to be the best moves <laughs> and... Maybe they're the fourth or the fifth in my list and I calculate a lot. So I do a lot of more effort than a GM to have the same outcome, which results that in a game against them, I lose because... Yeah, also that. It's, it's everything, actually. It's, um, they have better... Oh, give me a second. I need to answer a message. Um, yeah, GM grandmother. <coughs> so what nobody is saying is a good point. A strong GM calculates a line once. Weaker players keep rechecking. So that's right. And I think that's improved a lot. 
uh, with practice, basically. So I, I repeat my tip, my advice. Don't you bother spending 10 minutes, 20 minutes in a puzzle, no matter how easy it is. Um, the more time you spend, the the better you your your brain is gonna be working towards the goal of understanding things and solving things. Don't rush it. Um, probably when you have more experience, you're gonna do it faster for sure. But now, <laughs> don't rush it. Focus on the goal of solving the problems, understanding the things, not on being the best bullet player in your neighborhood. Um, and uh, yeah, visualization. It's not just about calculating, it's also visualizing. And um, in, the, in the past, I used to do that a lot, to recheck lines. Um, now, for some reason, I don't. <laughs> Sometimes I blunder, blunders happen, even, even Magnus blunders once every five years, but blunders happen, they will eventually happen less. I don't care about that. But I don't recheck my lines uh, unless necessary, unless I discover something that tells me, oh, I need to go deeper in that line because I missed something. Um, but yeah, somehow you develop that memory of knowing that line ended in that conclusion. I don't need to to look at it again. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, okay, now I'm gonna check the game, but give me give me a second. I really need to to answer this message. Uh, okay, so when is the right time to start playing bullet? Now every time, every time is, is right. But if if you're trying to, so this is how, for example, if you're, <laughs> I'm gonna put a stupid example, but it's really close to my current situation. If you're trying to to make bodybuilding and running at the same time, you have to solve some issues. And the same if you're trying to improve your understanding of chess and your bullet you have different goals there so you're gonna have a problem there so you have to prioritize what, what is more important to you um, because if you if you do bullets you're definitely gonna develop some skills I think chess is so complex that anything absolutely anything you decide to practice that is chess related will will help improve your chess in some way but you need to think what is your priority or what do you like most. Uh, words of wisdom, blah, 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 blah. I often recheck calculations and hate myself for it. <laughs> Magnus only blundered once in five years, but that once in a bullet game, and that is from a winning position to a less winning position. No, I was talking about his blunder against Gawain Jones, and he even won the game, so... <laughs> GM Lasse Anderson blunders once every tenth year. Nice. Okay, let's see the game then. Uh, no challenges now, sorry. So this was uh, Dingley Ring versus Magnus Carlsen. So let's put the black side who was the winning uh, from our point of view. And I'm gonna fast forward the opening until we get to the bishop per position. So this is gonna be an Imso Indian. So a, ver a very common opening to get uh, the bishop pair out of the opening, right? Uh, but in this case, who's gonna have the bishop per ah, so it's not the Nimso Indian. Okay, okay, he played d5 here. That was because I was going to say what? Didn't Magnus have the bishop per? Okay. <laughs> I feel like bullet is for learning openings fast and also finding interesting openings too. Yeah, I if I if I'm being honest with you guys, um I played like and I'm not lying, I, I made a calculation. <laughs> I made the numbers. Uh I played like 30,000 bullet games uh, before I got federated. So I like to say that I started playing chess like 11 years ago when I entered my first team. But the three years before that, I played a lot of bullet online when I discovered that I could play bullet online. <laughs> 
and I think I developed some skills, definitely, but some of them were the wrong ones, so to speak. Uh, it's like when you learn piano on your own or, you know, to play an instrument on your own and then you have some bad habits, then it's hard for you to get the good habits. So, careful with that. Anyway, um, let's follow the game until they... So, this is a Catalan, I guess. Queen c2, b5, rawr. <laughs> counterintuitive b4. I mean, from a bullet point of view, counterintuitive because of the rook hanging on a8. You have to defend that, knight e5. Hey, Joey! How are you, man? Kidding. How are you, my love? How are you feeling? You learned to lose to me, John John. <laughs> Very good point there. What point? Crappy. No. Okay, knight takes c4, c5. Ta 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 ta. c6. c8. Bishop there. Knight c5, c7. Twenty-seven. G G five. Okay, I I know I'm moving too fast, but I want to to get to the position where um, Bishop Arrow occurs, which maybe is in the end game. Three Bishop there, and here it is. So, but this is a very complicated position, isn't it? I mean, Carlsen played F six and G five. The point that it is much easier to learn something than to unlearn bad habits. Yeah, I, I feel that. I feel that way. I felt that, that way with, with chess and I felt that way with, uh, <laughs> with piano as well. I really enjoyed your stream yesterday, Headbanger Chess. Oh, Headbanger Chess, I don't know you. Are you a streamer? You, do you do chess as well? I hope with that nickname. Oh, you didn't tell me you were watching a stream yesterday, Joey. <laughs> I could have joined, maybe. Anyway, knight takes d4, queen takes d4. What do we have here? You recently started. Well, welcome to the family here, then. So, after I went to bed. Oh, so it was late for me. Okay. Hey, Queen Savage, what is up? So, uh, I would be worried about losing the bishop pair, but I guess it's not a problem. Uh, well, if you stream too late for me, <laughs> it's gonna be difficult because we probably have different time zones. Like, for example, it's past midnight already here, right now. Um... Okay, so was this game, guys, a uh, bishop pair endgame? Can I just move forward a bit? Because this position is so complex. I, we could spend maybe 20 minutes in every move. Pawn structure, this is so unbalanced. It's not just the bishop pair, it's uh, the pawn structure, this pawn here versus this pawn here, these advanced pawns. Just go to the point. Yeah, but I'm trying to know where the point is because we already have... <laughs> A bishop per situation. <laughs> you tell me what's the point. So, so isn't d5 hanging? Okay, he takes it in a different way. This is the famous game Magnus Ding. It looks that way, yes. And he saves the bishop. Okay. So I guess this is the point. We have bishop pair versus bishop and knight. Right? And... Yes, it is. Okay. And the pawn structure is totally symmetrical, except some pawns are more advanced than others, but, you know, from a file points, files point of view, it's totally symmetrical. Um, and now it's the things we mentioned many 
uh, you know, at the beginning of the stream, um, where, for example, having pawns in both sides of the board, you wouldn't mind, especially trading uh, one of the bishops for the bishop, because the the remaining bishop should be better than the knight in general. Uh, of course, then you have to calculate. Uh, tactics always uh, are there. Uh, or even the other bishop for this bishop. So that kind of trade could be great. Now, when it comes for trading one of the bishops for the knight, uh, different situations happen. For example, trading this bishop for the knight would be probably a draw. Would be probably a draw because opposite color bishops with no reason to pretend that black is better, except you have, I don't know, a space advantage or something. Very suspicious. From this position, maybe later it makes sense. Um, also, trading this bishop for the knight, uh, that's what I said, trading this bishop for the knight, going to a uh, same, same color bishop's endgame, would make sense if this bishop is great and this bishop is terrible, which would happen only after, for example, we have our pawns in dark squares and our opponent puts the pawn in light squares then that could be a great a great trade to do because his bishop would be bad our bishop would be good and we have more than one target then we can fight to win that because we have a good bishop versus bad bishop situation so those kind of conversions are there but some of them like this one only can happen in the future if we get a specific uh, situation with the pawn structure and some others like this for uh, for this i mean like uh, trading one of the bishops for the other could happen even now well not now because there's no way but really soon with this pawn structure because still an endgame where the bishop should be better than the knight at least that's the way i see it but in general you don't want to convert un unless it is clear i mean the bishop pair is already an advantage. You don't want to give it up. Uh, first, you're gonna try and, and put some problems to the to the weaknesses of of of, of white, of course. Uh, isn't it good that the queen side pawns would be fixed on white? So same color bishops would be quite good. Yes, if if you do that, which you cannot right now because the knight is here. And um, but if you get that. And for some reason you get to force moves where uh, in the other side you also have your pawns in dark squares and he has the pawns in light squares then you have the chance to to go for that conversion as well yes at least i think so bishop pair doesn't have to come to be converted it's a powerful weapon itself exactly only with an active king otherwise not so important yeah also that that is something you know we're in an end game so the best move for black now it's it's whose turn it is it's white's turn let's see what white played okay white played king f2 now the best move for black is obviously king d2 <laughs> right king d2 would be the best move but we cannot do it but yeah um in end games you should activate your king and uh dingley ring is himself a good end game player i like his end games um and he usually plays very active with the king in the end games. So I'm expecting this to be his idea, basically. <laughs> Only cheat if it's not obvious. Good good advice there. I think King Ding would notice King D2. Yeah. And of course I, I, I like there King D2 is obviously not the best move. King C2 is King B3. It is great. <laughs> no, what I mean is you need to activate your king in the endgame, which now doesn't look so easy because we have this pawn here on f6. So let's see how how Magnus did this. The problem maybe is that if this king goes too far away, these pawns could be could be potentially weaknesses. King b3 is a blunder. Oh, I didn't see the knight. <laughs> 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 Good point. It would be such such a shame to <laughs> to cheat and make a blunder. Not if you continue to cheat. Ah, yeah, that's good point. Yeah, after after King B three ninety five check, you play King C five. 
right? Okay. Let's. That's how we analyze Carlsen's games, huh? <laughs> that's that's how we do it. I'm sure he didn't saw, he didn't see these lines. Okay, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, of course. A five. Look at that. I was wondering how would Magnus incorporate his king. A five, which makes a lot of sense. Let's use the dark squares. You know, it's really hard to go. I mean, not not hard, but it, it's not so easy to go on the light squares when when our opponent has a light square bishop. If we go there, he might check us here sometime at some moment. So let's use this. Just kidding. I think it would be a good move against <laughs> any bishop. It's not about the color. It's about you know making a line for the king to go. So bishop g8. That's a very deep move. <laughs> Need to understand. <laughs> hey, Jana. Thanks for the thanks for the host. Uh, I think I guess bishop g8 is anticipating king d4 and making it uh, not be with with tempo i don't know uh maybe also defending h7 before before we we go up with the king uh sometimes trying to understand magnus moves can take a while <laughs> sorry i thought i was i'm a bad girlfriend no you're the best girlfriend john john is hosting thanks <laughs> that one blunder was probably the last move of the game i think to play bishop f6 without knight c5 with tempo uh, knight d6 maybe or, or knight e5 if i remember correctly bishop g8 was actually sassy recommendation but yeah you, you have a point there the bishop was exposed find me joanna i can host too yeah but joanna is my girlfriend and you are not jen jong So yeah, the bishop is exposed there, not only exposed to king d4, but also to uh, specifically the, the knight jumps. Boom, exactly, boom. So, cool move. Actually, I, I brought some examples. <laughs> Hugs, John. Don't feel bad, John John. Uh, do you still have my, my picture that I made to you? You're still a friend for me. <laughs> still not so obvious why it's the best move. Yeah, why why bishop g8 is better than bishop f7? Maybe we see in the future that this pawn has to be defended. I don't know, we'll see. Or maybe we won't see it, but let's see how the game continued. Um, g4. G4. So obviously not going for for a same color bishop's endgame. So if the pawns were to be in black squares and white has the pawns in, in light squares we said it would be nice to trade this for this because then his white has a bad bishop we have a good bishop no Magnus idea is no 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 I'm gonna use the bishop pair I don't want to trade any bishops I want you to put the pawns in dark squares so when I attack them you have no bishop to defend them heading to bed okay good night John John So I assume Ding took. No, he didn't take. Um, I don't know. If I'm feeling like I'm defending, I I tend to take pawns. But I guess first of all, I didn't spend more than ten seconds to think about it. <laughs> and, and second, I'm not a GM. I think Bishop G8 because it's as far away from the knight as possible. Yeah, that's right. Uh, 
g8 and a2 would be the two squares where the knight can that the knight cannot attack in one move which makes sense well also d5 but of course that wasn't available okay so g4 knight a5 bishop c5 now that it is available oh snap was white in Susan? couldn't he do something different Hard to suggest moves when when your opponent is <coughs> cutting the ball like this. I can understand why bishop g8 not the other square, but it's hard to understand why not to delay this move. Um, so let's go back there. So for example, why not doing g4 first? <coughs> A lot, some deep subtleties that Magnus plays with 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 move orders. Um, I mean, um, after Bishop G8, I guess Knight A5 doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, something like that. Maybe it's more flexible. Like, okay, I'm telling you, Knight A5 is not gonna win a tempo, so I can do any move then. Although probably Bishop C5 is gonna happen anyway. Um, so I'm giving you the chance to, to move your king so that I can play g4 when your king is uh, away. Something like that. And bishop g8 is a move that must happen at some point. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. Okay, I'm going to have to go bishop g8. I'll do it now so that you cannot win any tempo. And if you play knight a5, now it's not a tempo I can do. I can be flexible. Although well, I think bishop g5 would be the, my move anyway. Okay, so g4, knight a5, bishop c5. Uh, I see that threat of bishop e1. Knight c4, bishop g1. Knight e3. So he's trying to trap this bishop somehow. I don't see how. Now I think Ding is basically trying to trade off the pawns. To get a draw with a good idea now if we take on h2 he takes on g4 twice and we eliminate all of these pawns yeah we're gonna be a pawn down but but the more pawns that disappear from the board the easier it will be to defend uh knight takes f5 and g takes oh yeah and this keeps defended so maybe <laughs> yeah actually actually these are the only ones that disappear although probably then after Bishop e6 at some point we're gonna take on g3. But yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. So I guess Magnus defended f5. Yeah. Now he trades. And now king e2. Saying, okay, now if you take on h2, I might trap your bishop. Makes sense. So clearly this is the bishop that is uncontested. From a bishop's pair point of view, this is the one that if you get it active against weaknesses, you make the most damage, and that's what Magnus is trying to. Uh, sorry, yeah, Magnus is trying to do, but Ding is <laughs> resourceful, and he's saying, "I might trap your bishop. Be careful." Magnus plays h5. He's saying, "Okay, I'm gonna take because then I have h4. That makes sense." Bishop d5, trying to trade. I think I figured out. Bishop g8, why it doesn't have a useful move? And after g4 first, you have king f4. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. That after bishop g8, you pass the turn. So the next move by Ding was moving the king away. So yeah, something something like that we talked about. Mm, about that. So he waits for king d3, exactly. Because I guess if you don't play king d3, you have to play like knight a5 and then bishop c5 will happen anyway. So it would probably be like similar to the game. Anyway, I guess Magnus didn't trade. Yeah. <laughs> Hitting the pawn on a4. Oh, I expected b3 here.
but I guess he might want this square for the knight, I don't know. It's tough to, to have a passive piece there, and also imagine that this is going to be weak, uh, available for this guy. Anyway, Magnus takes the pawn. King f2, so I guess h4 must be played, because this is a threat, and this is also a threat. h4, saving the bishop. Uh, takes, now the bishop is free. There's an annotation, an annotation here from the engine that says that knight f1 was better, but the position is already minus 2, so at this point players are playing like... at least thing is probably playing like a human, not like an engine, trying to save this position. Bishop e5. Horrible. <laughs> Not if one doesn't help. Yeah, it's. I guess it's everything. When the engine says minus two point something, I guess everything is losing. So here, um, what happens if knight c4? Oh, knight c4 was played. Okay, so we'll see. <laughs> okay, knight c4 is a very human move. Defense attacks, and what does he do? Oh, g3. I thought. I thought bishop. Bishop. Uh, here, but of course you keep this under control. So I guess g3, bishop c7. Let's see, g3 check. King moves to g1. And bishop f4. And this is what we call... This is what we call domination, guys. Look at that knight. Only has one square. Horrible square on a5. And it's blocking the bishop. <laughs> Terrible. Bishop d1. It came from a5. Yeah, <laughs> it came from a5, exactly. The only square he has it has is to go back to that square. And it's not like he has more squares from a5, I mean, to b7. Okay, bishop d1, bishop c6. Keeping this, ki this king on a cage now. b3 finally. King h6. Ding is still not making it easy. No, he's a very good player, and I like his endgames. I like, I actually used some of them. Uh, for my classes, it's a very technical, skilled endgame player, but yeah, Carlsen <laughs> a5. Black King can't enter for now, that's true. Black King can enter, cannot enter. Uh, if he ever tries to enter this way, I guess the bishop can cover, <coughs> although <coughs> I don't know, <clears throat> maybe it cannot. Ah, then the bishop goes back to d1. And he cannot, and this is defended. But such a horrible position for for white pieces. This knight is dominated. Uh, this bishop is sort of overloaded, protecting the h5 square and the b3 pawn. Bishop e4, king f1, king goes maybe, sorry, not there, not there, Pepe, goes maybe this way, <coughs> we'll see, king f6, <laughs> ding is doing nothing, king f1, king g1, and now h5, so if he does nothing, this king will come here, I guess, and then maybe even bishop c2 is an easy way, or bishop d3 check, bishop takes c4, yeah, once the king is here already, So h5, king there anyway, a6, king there, um, so even here, oh I thought we could already do this check and take, but if we check he plays e2, check, 
Yeah, we could do that, right? Check and take. Bishop e2 is not available because of g2, I think. So check and take should probably win uh, or not. Maybe he plays king g2 followed by h6 and this is not quite winning or is it... Okay, no need for that. He plays king d4. Magnus kept it simple from here. Okay. Give me a second, I have a message. Okay. King c3, okay. Uh, <laughs> Bishop e6 for the trick. Now if takes. <laughs> One second. Uh, he has some discovered check or something. So bishop c2. Okay, I'm gonna take with the bishop. Knight a5 defending. Good call. Oh, snap. That knight is not stable on a5. Knight b7. I would consider to attack this d a7 pawn at least. I don't know. Oh. Shoot. Okay, no more moves. No more moves. Yeah, he resigned here. Yeah, that was a complete complete domination of the bishop pair. Yep. Okay, so what's the time? Uh Almost 1 a.m. Do you want to see uh, some more games? I have more examples, some of great players, some of some very beautiful of like attacks <laughs> with even <laughs> accidentally or eventually with the bishop pair, but not the main main theme maybe of, of those games. I have games from from my own play. Maybe we can see specific positions from those games instead of the whole games. Um, good night, Malek. Knight b7, a5, c4, e3, c4, a5, b7. How embarrassing. Yeah. Speaking of embarrassing, <laughs> seeing one of the games I have here. Um, uh, this was a blitz game, no increment. As you can see, both of us made blunders, but I thought it was funny at some point. Um, I was white against a strong player. I'm moving forward, but I already have the bishop pair, sorry, from the opening when he decided, uh, sorry, <laughs> here, to take on f3. The typical, in this case in the Karokan, but in some openings you put the bishop on g4 to take then, so yeah, in this case I happen to have the bishop pair from the beginning. And still I went for the advance, I don't know why I went for a closed structure, anyway. Yeah, let's move forward because despite the blunders that happened around here when I played knight c3, which is a horrible blunder, and my opponent played knight c3, obviously, knight b3, sorry, I found a good trick and he didn't, and he believed me, <laughs> so he didn't do the obvious, so that was funny. So knight takes d5, um, uh, so yeah, there are a couple of ideas here, if he takes my queen, I take his queen, hit the rook, etc. He hits my rook. Uh, the other line is if he takes on d5, I take with the bishop with check, then I get to trade on b3. Um, and that's the best line for him, because of course he takes a free piece for, for two pawns. From a practical point of view, interesting, because I have two passers connected, but that's objectively the, the best move for him, the best line for him. 
Um, uh, but anyway, he didn't want any of that. Have to say that this was uh, again a blitz game. Um, no increment, not really passers their block. Yeah, exactly. It's it's definitely very good for black. This is minus three according to the engine. But I don't know. He got scared of something. I think this guy is. He doesn't have the title of international master, but he got to that level at some point in the past, but um, he went down a bit after that. Anyway, <clears throat> he did this horrible queen d8 move, and after this I traded queens, and we got to this position where where I have three two, 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 two pawns up, and bishop pair versus knight pair. Uh, he still has. Oh, sorry, sorry. He takes the exchange, of course. So it's not that clear, yeah. <laughs> so I have an exchange for for a couple of pawns. So from a material point of view, it's uh, he has the exchange for a couple of pawns. Sorry, from a material point of view, it's equal. But I have the bishop pair, and also I have after his move rook c2. Um, I have this move now which I'm sure you all see what would you play here as white given that we have the bishop pair and we want to use it uh, I'm gonna grab a fizzy water while you tell me what would you play here And Infernal Cash is saying D5, exclam D5. D5 is what I played, of course, of course. Yeah, give me, give me open diagonals, give me activity. Um, again, this was a blitz game, mistakes were made for him from now on, specifically. <laughs> um, but still, I thought it was funny the end game because the two bishops did a good job here um, pawn takes king takes and I played the obvious from a human point of view but not from a engine point of view um, f4 after the game a very strong player that was looking at the game said man rook d1 was really strong instead of f4 and it was but my idea was to play it after f4 rook fc8 blunder and now I played rook d1 with two threats, but he only saw one of them. Um, he saw the threat rook d6 check to win the knight, because the king must go there. So he prevented that, but by pinning my rook. And yeah, <laughs> I don't think I think. I don't recall doing this a lot, checkmating an opponent, a strong opponent, in the middle of the board. Yeah, and I take c5 maybe was needed after rook fc8. Rook fc8 was a blunder, yeah. He didn't see rook d, the rook d1 threat. So, yeah, I mated him in the middle of the board. So this is, <laughs> this is a strong bishop pair, isn't it? Yeah, what about knight b6? Yeah, I mean, actually I have knight b6 here in my in my notes of the game. Knight b6, bishop takes b7, rook c4, rook d6 check, king f7, bishop f3. Ah, threatening bishop h5, that's nasty. Rook c1, king there, rook here, king <laughs> Okay, I have this line for some reason, I don't remember it. And the line stops here, but yeah. 
No rook c1 after bishop d7. Uh, rook c1, bishop takes c8 with check, right? Yep. Okay, yeah, any move that doesn't hang mate it would be better than what he did. I just thought it was funny to share this. It's not that actually I was in a bad situation until he decided uh, not to take my knight. So in this situation I'm already, uh, you know, bishop pair. I'm already in a good position, but then he blundered everything here. I mean, king f7 was already a bad move, etc. But okay, just wanted to share. It was a blitz game, doesn't have a lot of importance. Now, I have some of my classical chess games that might be a bit more interesting. Although, to be honest, I don't have good examples of bishop pair usage against strong players for some reason, only against weak players. I have one from this last league I played. I have one against I have one against a twenty hundred. I think that's the strongest I have. This one. Who Igor? No, 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 no. From <laughs> from the over the board chess league with my team, classical chess. Um, one hour and a half plus 30 seconds per player. Yeah, so I'm gonna fast forward the game a bit, uh, pass over the opening that wasn't very great uh, because here I already played a very secondary line, bishop before check and um, yeah some things happen here but let's not go deeper there are probably at least 100 games where Kasparov gives material for the bishops yeah I have a couple of examples no I finally didn't include Kasparov's examples I think no nope. but yeah I have some other examples from great players but okay so f4 r is trading bishops and now at some point Oh no, it takes a while to, to take the bishop pair here. I'm in some trouble, I have to play that, etc. But he missed an opportunity here. Sorry to move so fast, I want to get to this position. After bishop f3 and rook a d8, which is equalish. Maybe slightly better for black. Um, I was happy that he has those long-term weaknesses. But here he played a very bad move. He played uh, bishop f2. Allowing me to make what I wanted. g5, breaking up the structure, weakening e5. And he went back to defending f4, which <laughs> already indicates that his last move was bad. Uh, takes an g6. And because he doesn't want to, to lose this, he has to allow for me to grab the, the bishop pair now, which he does, which uh, with e6, I takes e7, I, well, I checked, I could have taken on e7 immediately, but I wanted to win a tempo against the bishop. So now we have the bishop pair, and he doesn't, but uh, <laughs> this is like the best situation where I can possibly have a bishop pair. Uh, the board is opening, is open for my bishops, and his thing, his king is totally opened. So this game will not last a lot from this point on. Um, so okay, maybe not a very instructive example of bishop pair, but he is already completely lost in this position. Even though the material is just only a pawn up for me, but look at this king. Uh, look at the dark squares. <laughs> he. <laughs> So, yeah, it was more or less easy from this point. Uh, queen d6. I'm absolutely not scared to trade queens. 
having uh, bishop pair pawn up, open king, terrible knight. Oops, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> I fast forward too much. Queen d6, I hit the wrong key. Queen h3, d4, r. Got that bishop, so beautiful. Um, with d3 pinning, queen h6. And now he was scared. He told me if he moves the queen, I was going to play. He was scared of pawn takes, I think. Or I think it was pawn takes, the one that was, he was scared. So he decided to trade queens and then take on d4. And then I played bishop e3 and he resigned because aren't these bishops strong? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, he has to give up the exchange, but I'm gonna take it immediately, of course. I'm gonna have a passer defended. So that was easy from the moment he he lost the pawn and the bishop pair, he got destroyed. But because there were some things already in the position, that, that's what I said before. Um, it's not that A implies B. Sometimes it's the other way around, so it's just things that go well together. In this case, the bishop pair was <laughs> amazingly good because the position was already weak for his king and open. The board was open. No beer in the fridge. No, terrible. Um, let's pick up an example from some great player from the past. I have one from uh, Geller here. Let me see if I recall this game. I have also from uh, Botvinnik. I think the Botvinnik one was cool. Can't remember. Mm -mm -mm. I don't have any annotation here. So let's see the game. Okay. Ah, yeah, I remember this game. Look at that. So, <coughs> Botvinnik plays knight h3. Um, strange looking move. Instead of knight, knight f3. Yeah. And for some reason, Bronstein says, Oh, I have to take that. I'm not really sure whether. There was a reason to take there on h3, to be honest. Um, I mean, the only difference from, you know, with the knight there instead of here is that now the knight can go to f4, build some pressure on d5. Well, I don't know. After e6, d5 is going to be pretty solid, at least. Uh, that's what I think. I don't know if someone in the chat can understand why Bronstein would take the knight here. I'm really confused but he took it immediately so Botvinnik has the bishop pair cool and uh, Bronstein says I'm fine I have a dark square bishop I have all the pawns in light squares what can be wrong well I guess the light squares can be wrong bishop d2, rook c8, castles 97 not sure what the idea is. Maybe. 92, queen b6. Well, it wasn't that. Bishop c3. <coughs> d8, knight f4. So the knight goes back to f6. Uh, hey, Giko, thanks for the follow. I guess the knight will land on e4 at some point. Queen b3, knight e4. And here we have a situation where. A terrible bishop is passive and it's threatened to be taken. Bishop takes knight wins time and development advantage. Not sure. It gives away the bishop pair too early. Too early. Because there are positions where a bishop is better than a knight. There are positions with where the bishop pair excels. 
but in the opening with, with everything still to be decided it's very committed to take a decision when you still don't know <laughs> whether you're gonna get a good or a bad position for bishop pair or knights or whatever you're trying to achieve with that trade mm. I don't know <clears throat> I think it's very committed anyway here uh, Botvinnik makes a move here that is very very typical well first he trades queens sorry trades queens and now he does a move that is very typical of these positions development yes but close position hmm. so sometimes when you have the bishop pair like in this case white has the bishop pair white also has maybe a tiny structural advantage there although it's really hard to get this knight here it takes a while but yeah this could possibly be an advantage in the future but we have the bishop pair so bishop e1 this is this is a common idea bishop e1 is uh, <laughs> is um okay a passive move a move that you don't want to do um in general but you're patient you preserve one of your biggest assets which is the bishop pair in this case i've done myself this kind of move a lot of a lot of times i preserve the bishop pair i will remove the knight from f from from e4 at some point and i'll put my bishop either back there or on f2 but um <laughs> it's like bishop d8 in the alapin game <laughs> yeah yeah, although I played bishop h4 instead of bishop d8, but yes. Yes, and I think I have one game where I did this, maybe in this study. So bishop e1, you preserve the, the bishop pair, even though there's no clear advantage now, um, or it's not working, the bishop pair now, but it's gonna be in the future. Even though this bishop was terrible here it is terrible I mean it's hitting his own pawns but still you preserve it 94 93 bishop there and finally f3 happens the knight has to go away now the bishop can move and he puts it on f2 okay now for example if rook c2 happens thanks to this beautiful knight defending b2 we can fight immediately for for the open file and maybe even trade all the rooks and the more other pieces you trade the more um, important this imbalance is gonna be and I think someone said that the other day I've heard it many times but someone said that the other day some strong player that whenever you have an, an imbalance in your favor you try trade the other pieces. <laughs> you trade the other pieces, and then that imbalance is going to be more, more important. Have some messages. Let me see. Okay, never mind. <coughs> is it fine if I put an old game of mine with me, two bishops or no? With the two bishops or no? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, anything you can share with us. Um, which is related to the topic. I just picked some random games actually. It's not like I had prepared anything. I'm not sure if I will be able to analyze it <laughs> better than you, but yeah, sure. Um, okay, let's move forward a bit. Um, see when the bishop pair is gonna be excelling in this game. So far, uh, Black is not finding anything, so there we go. We trade all the rooks. Bishop a3, good move. Intends to take a pawn on b3. And white says, okay, you can have a pawn. I will have the bishop pair. <laughs> so in this position, black is a pawn up. It's not the best pawn ever, we have to say. It's doubled. So it's almost, almost like equal pawns. But white has the bishop pair. In this position, according to the engine, this is totally equal. 
but it's so much fun for white when you have the two bishops. And this is a weakness now on, on b6. It's not so easy to attack, but maybe, maybe bishop takes a6 followed by bishop c7 is always cashing a pawn back. The problem is we're a pawn down. So e4, opening up some lines, and according to the engine, this was the blunder e5. Yeah, okay. Bishop d3, bishop d6. This is from the World Championship match. Yes! Two meme knights O and C. On the rim, yeah. Uh, bishop b1 mm, I guess it has some explanation I'm, I guess after takes takes he's intending to do some move that is not moving the bishop I don't know suddenly recognize the position <laughs> nice yeah it is let me see uh, 1951 from the world championship match yes Bishop B1, King there, Bishop B3. Trades, H4. Bishop B1 wants to take on D5 and Bishop A2. Yeah, Bishop A2 and take on D5, yeah. Um, so white you know, this pawn is safe because there's no way to attack it and it's controlling these two pawns. This pawn is safe because it's defended, this pawn is safe because it's never going to be attacked and it can be defended and the bishops are working very well. This bishop can go here. So far it's dominating this knight here. Uh, this bishop can go here, tickle this. If the king never moves, maybe this bishop can attack this guy or this guy. Uh, so, <laughs> black is a pawn up but Position is not no fun at all. Uh, knight b8 appears to be a blunder, but the position is so delicate. Um, bishop g5 check, king there, bishop f5. So this starts looking like a threat. And if knight f5 happens, then bishop d8 hitting this, and then knight d7 is not possible because the bishop is on c8. Yeah, it feels like every Black's pawn is a weakness, and the knights themselves are weaknesses. Um, they cannot coordinate well to defend every pawn. Knight e7, preventing bishop c8 precisely. Bishop f4 hitting the other knight, has to go to c6 or a6. Goes to c6. Maybe to defend with knight a5, the b7 pawn. Bishop d3, I guess, trying to attack this guy at some point. Knight c8, bishop e2, king must go to g6. He repeats, goes to f6, repeats, <laughs> goes to g6, and now bishop f3. Maximum pressure, now the king must g defend this guy, and now one knight must defend this pawn. So knight c7, uh, sorry, knight 6 e7. So now this guy is tied to this, this guy is tied to this, and bishop g5, and black resigned in this position. Did you ever resign in a position where you had a material advantage? I hate when that happens. This is a uh, Suktuan, basically. So, the king is defending this, the knight is defending this, the knight is protecting the knight that is defending that. And these pawns cannot advance without being lost. So black would love to say, uh, no please, you move. <laughs> you white move. Pathetic knights, yeah. So if you move the king, you lose this pawn at least. If you move this knight, you lose this pawn at least. 
if you move this knight, you lose the other knight. If you move this, this pawn, you, you, you lose it, and then after you play b6, <laughs> white is gonna spend one tempo so that you are back in Suxuan again. So, so great, great domination here. Clear Suxuan and Bronstein resigned in a pawn up position but completely lost. Now, what else do I have here? Um, maybe this game? I don't know if my game was the best example, but I should send it to you on Liches. Uh, if you... How, how you want it. I mean, if you have the PGN and you can paste it on the chat or on Liches, whatever... However you, you want. Um, in the meantime, I can show this one real quick. Knight f5 and knight eight d6, but he was probably fed up with this. Wow, 31. I mean, 87. That's hot in there, Joey. But okay, it's 6 p.m. there, so... It was too long to send in chat. Okay. It's it's 60 here. Okay, let me open that in a new tab and I'll copy it and paste it here. So hot and humid. Uh, well, humidity is, is always higher here in Galicia, as you can tell by, <laughs> by uh, the outcome of night pots there. Yeah, humidity is definitely not going to be a problem for me. Everywhere where... Yeah, yeah, humidity is the is what we have here. The, yeah. <laughs> you need a scrub mask. No, anywhere I, I go in the world, I think I cannot have more humidity than here. I'm going to be fine anywhere. <laughs> Minnesota is is Egan, uh, nobody. Yeah, the weather in Egan, that's in Minnesota. And the weather in Mijatoiro, that's that's here in Galicia. Okay, so thanks for the game. I'm gonna copy paste it. Mm. It gets too cold and too cold here. Hmm. So I am um, where I live now, it gets decently hot and decently cold, but where I am from, <laughs> um, not where I live now, but where I am from, where I grew up, back in Orense, it gets too hot and too cold. It's like the hottest place in Spain in the summer, like 50 close to 50 uh, degrees Celsius, which I cannot tell, maybe it's 100 and a lot Fahrenheit. <laughs> and yeah, and in the winter, um, not so cold as Minnesota because snow is rare, but it's there. <laughs> okay, so let's see, let's add this chapter. Thanks for sharing. PGN, create chapter, chapter 19, we don't have the players' names, <coughs> so one of them was Infernal Cash, just tell me whether you were, I guess you were black, because I guess you won't. I had well over 40 once in Malaga, that was no fun. Yeah, the the highest temperature you have in... Oh, your internet cut out. Oh, okay. It gets decently... It gets decently. Hmm. 
it gets decent. Did I say that? <laughs> it gets decently hot. Uh, oh yeah, here in here in Santiago, uh, yeah, it gets hot and cold, but not a, a lot. But where I am from, where I grew up, as a kid, well, until my twenties, <laughs> um, in Orense. It's really hot and really cold. And I was saying that the hottest temperature, the highest temperature in the summer in Spain is back there in my in my hometown, uh, Orense. Close to 50, 50 Celsius, which is, I'm going to tell you real quick, 50 Celsius to Fahrenheit. I said 100 and a lot, but I'm going to tell you exactly. Yes, 122, exactly. Close close to that in the hottest days, but more than 40 for most of uh, July and August. And yeah, nobody is saying that he, he had well over 40 once in Malaga. Um, so in the summer you have the highest temperatures in Spain are in Malaga, Sevilla, so in great part of Andalusia. Malaga, Sevilla, Granada, Córdoba, those cities. Also Madrid. Madrid, very hot in, in the summer as well. And Ourense. <laughs> Ourense, which is weird because Galicia is supposed to be a cold place or cool in the summer. But Ourense is like a micro, micro weather there. And it's really hot. Really, really hot in the summer. And it's also really cold in the, in the winter. As, and, and I said, um, snow there in the winter. Snow is rare, but it's there, <laughs> so so it, it gets cold. It's not as cold, yeah, not as not as cold as Minnesota, of course. How do you spell that town? Oh, I'm gonna tell you in the chat. Owens. Name. The name comes from. Um, from the Roman Empire name of the city and it relates to the to the thermal waters that it has and part of the <laughs> part of the heat of the of the town is because it's over well some people tell there's the, the rumor that it's over a hidden volcano but ah, that's not true it's just a lot of uh, thermal activity in the area Anyway, let's have a look at this game that very kindly um, Infernal Cash shared with, with us. Come to Ireland! Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Savely. Um, sometimes rain, sometimes sun, but most of the time overcast. That's how it is here in Santiago, to be honest. Thermal activity even after you left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know how. Now thermal activity is there and here. <laughs> okay, um, so you were black, let's flip the board. Um, and you played a Sicilian, nice. F9 3, D6, D4, takes, takes. All pretty standard. Nidorf. Bishop g5, knight b7. I have no clue. I don't play the Sicilian, so if you want to do any, any comments on the opening, I, I'll just move forward until some bishop takes f6 happens or something. Back when I was adventurous. Okay. So queen b6. You, you don't play bishop e7? <laughs> okay. Queen b6, rook b1. Queen c5. Roar! Forcing him to to do something with the bishop, and he took on f6. Cool. In wg. In wg. In. What do you mean, Ingo? <laughs> Translate. What does wg mean? Uh, stand for? In which level is this game? 
I played e6 inviting the sack there. Oh, okay. I didn't even consider the 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 sack switch to smartphone. Oh yes, um, infernal. If you can uh, give us some context, uh, I don't know the rating of the players or the time control or whatever you want to tell about the game. Um, that would be nice. Queen b6 because I used to know theory. Ah, okay, so you hit the b2 pawn and then you 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 fork the two bishops, so he's pr probably forced to take on f6. And bishop b3. Okay. I was 20-80 on Liches and he was 90-20, I think provisional. 15 plus 15. Ah, okay, so it's an online game. Cool. Okay. So bishop b3, bishop e7, normal. So far, um, I like black. Um, because as many times happens in the Sicilian, you have more control of the center for the moment. In this case, you have the bishop pair. And yes, your queen is funny there, but it's actually active and not easy to, to, to attack unless with a move that you don't really want to do because yeah, it can that. So yeah, like black, king h1. Uh, clearly stating that he wants to go f4, f5, which I guess makes sense against uh, this pawn here. B5, of course. I can. I I never play the Sicilian, but I can identify identify the the um, typical themes of the opening. Losing that bishop is already advantage for Black. Yeah. It was. I mean, I guess Rook B1 was a, was a mistake already. Um, Bishop b3, yeah, bishop b3 would make more sense. Um, yeah, but after rook b1, I, I, queen c5, that's a fork. I mean, <laughs> I don't see anything better than bishop takes f6. So, okay, let's move forward again to the position after king h1, b5, f3, not f4. So that was his idea, which is really weird in a way. Um, because now that's not a, I don't know, castles, queen d2. I mean, when you have this, you would love to have a dark square bishop. I think he was afraid of b4. Yeah, so he defended uh, e4. But I guess at some point, if, that's what I will always say. When you have a problem, a strategical problem, sometimes you need to find or you need to look for a tactical solution or at least a tactical mess. I don't know, maybe a 4 and b4, maybe there are some e5 ideas. Um, yeah, the pawn is probably lost in the end and you're weakening <laughs> your king a lot, this diagonal, but the drunk diagonal, this diagonal. Maybe there are some some other ideas that could be a mess, but three such a sad move to do. Castle queen d two, bishop b seven, and now he does that, which makes sense. Which makes sense in a way. Uh, yeah, so he takes two pawns for. You miss this idea after bishop b seven. Ah, okay. I guess you're still fine, you have the bishop pair, but yeah, now d6 is weak. He gets the exchange for... It's now interesting. Queen e5. I like that. Centralized. Uh, you put it on the king side before he blocks your, your pass there. Mm, I like queen e5, yeah. And now the rook comes here. So... This bishop is maybe not attacking yet, but it's there, it's pointing there. And it's not clear how you're gonna do it, but you have your pieces there ready 
to, to build something. So let's see how the game went on. Rook b1. Why not put in pressure on d6? Because it's defended. Yeah, simply. Don't like rook takes f8. You don't like rook takes f8? Why not? I mean... Um, I think I don't like the alternatives. <laughs> oh, you mean the knight is trapped anyway or something? I mean, wouldn't you take it here? <laughs> With bishop seems more flexible. Like... Hmm. Okay, I guess that makes sense because the bishop has no... no squares to go anyway. So you give more options for your queen and rook. Is that your point? Um, I don't know, I think if we ever move this knight, yeah, maybe the problem is we, we're not going to play this, we're not going to move this knight, and with our bishop being a target here, knight e5 would pr probably force some trades, so I sort of understand what you mean. Knight e5 never attacks the bishop, yeah, yeah, I understand what you mean. That maybe with the bishop here, knight e5 will force some trade. So, yeah, I can see that. And rook goes to c8 indeed. Yeah, the rook the rook can go there anyway after rook takes f8. The same as the bishop can go back to e7 at some point. But, but yeah, I see your point. Yeah, and that's a good good appreciation because, especially having the bishop pair, it's good that knight e5 doesn't hit the bishop. So that's a good point and. To be honest, when you said you didn't like rook f8, it took me... Uh, I mean, I was having a bad time understanding why. But uh, that's a really good point. Uh, thanks for sharing. Of course, um, in, in chess there are some... Uh, how to say it? Stat statics, statical factors and dynamic factors. So, it's an, I think I, I, I think very statically, usually, <laughs> not very dynamically. So, so my assessments go like, okay, I have the bishop here, you don't, I have that, you don't have that, but you, you need to see the tactics on the moves and 95 is a move. Statistics, not the statistics, no. <laughs> static, static, something static. Um, yeah, bishop takes f8 more flexible because if 95 ever happens, you can even have the chance to do nothing <laughs> because uh, your bishop is not attacked, so you can wait for him to take on f6. Okay, anyway. Let's continue with the game. Queen h5 uh, looks nice. This knight is still kind of in the middle of the pieces that want to attack. Let's see how how it goes. And d5, rawr. d5. Very interesting. I was trying to find a move after rook h1. Yeah, it's a bit hard the way the pieces are. Um, this is actually a good wall now, so I guess d5 makes sense, you're trying to break that wall. I would try to <laughs> maneuver around it somehow, move the knight, bring the bishop, bring the rook. But yeah, he, he's trying to harass your queen, although after knight g3, it looks like your queen is going to be pretty safe on h4, so I wouldn't be very scared of knight g3. It would be nice if we had a way to put the bishop here. So maybe knight e8 could be an option at some point. Uh, but anyway, you play d5. Because I wanted d5 but without the queen on the same file as the rook. Thematic opening of the position for the bishop pair. Well, there are many openings where you, you have trades like bishop on b4 takes on c3. For example, the winnower or the nimso indian. 
the winner were meaning the line of the French defense um, so lines where bishop on b4 takes on, on c3 now there are some lines where bishop on g4 takes on f3 for example you can see that in the Scandinavian in many lines uh, or in the Karokan we've seen one example today um, but of course in many other openings in the Pirch you have lines in, in many openings of e4 openings you, you, you have that for black as Infernal Cash is pointing out the Rosolimo for example uh, the first game we saw today it was that a Sicilian where black, white played bishop b5 but in that game he didn't take on c6 but um, was referring to d5 though not sure what you mean <laughs> ah you mean thematic break not opening you mean d5 thematic break for the bishop pair <laughs> okay 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 <laughs> still i think it was a, a useful information we were sharing here <laughs> Opening the position. Okay, okay, okay. Gotcha. But now let me finish. Now let me finish. Bishop on b5, taking on c6. You can sit in the Rosolimo of the Sicilian. You can sit in the exchange uh, of the Rui Lopez exchange variation, and in some others as well. And Bishop on g5, taking on f6. You can see it. Well, we saw it here. So in some Sicilians, it happens. But for example, in the Trompowski, or um, it's not a Tory attack, but um, yeah, many d4 openings where you play g5. That's not the Tory attack, right? It's the Collie. I always mix up those openings. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but there's also the Botvinnik variation of the. of the Semislav, I think, the Vodvinic variation, where you play bishop g5 and they play h6 and sometimes you play uh, bishop h4, g5, knight takes g5, pawn takes, bishop takes and then e5 and eventually the bishop gets traded for the knight. But bishop takes f6 immediately should have a different name. Is that the Moscow? I never played d4 so I'm speaking from what I heard. <laughs> Is that the Moscow? I think it's the Moscow variation of the Semislav when you take on... I mix all those lines, the Moscow, the Merano, because I never play that. Anyway, let's not talk about openings anymore. D5, let's continue. Cole blocks the bishop, so it must be the Tory. Okay, it must be the Tory attack. H6 and then D takes C4. Don't know any names, only care about the moves. Okay. Koli. Where Black gets G5 and B5 is the Moscow. Okay. Okay, never mind. Don't, uh, don't mind me. So Knight G3 and Queen G6. Yeah, in the Semislav. I, I was talking about the Semislav, but yeah, basically if bishop g5 happens, uh, whenever black plays h6, white is usually um, at least considering to take on f6 because it's like you don't carry a weapon if you're not uh, ready to use it. Well, you don't put the bishop on g5 if you're not ready to take on f6. Why would you play bishop g5 to then go back after h6? Well, sometimes there are reasons, but I mean, in general. Okay, queen g6. Um, according to the analysis, queen f7 was better, but blah, blah, blah. You keep the queen there, which makes sense. Pawn takes, now knight takes. No, bishop d6. <clears throat> was knight takes d5 a move? Or is that too crazy? Well, never mind. Bishop d6, blocking the pawn. 
Now rook e6 could be a move, maybe. Knight e4. Now you preserve the bishop pair by taking the knight, giving two connected pawns. Take e7 and queen d7. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, you're right, nobody. So, good point. Knight takes, rook takes. Knight takes, queen. Queen d7, and there's no useful way for those two pieces to threaten something. So, two pieces for the rook. Two pieces for the rook and pawn, although that pawn is already... Okay, never mind. <laughs> I was trying to remember, but thanks for helping. Yeah, okay. Hey, Tenta, you're back. So, bishop d6 blocking, knight e4, now takes, takes. And yeah, two connected uh, pass pawns, but on the other hand, uh, uh, they're not easy to advance. Actually, this is blocked, and if you ever push this, which is hard now because this rook is attacking this one, um, also it will unleash this attack of this bishop. Oh, I know one game I should bring out. I just recalled one game where my opponent sacrificed the queen, and he had the two bishops, and he killed me. I should find that game, <laughs> although it's an embarrassment for me. <laughs> I should bring that game. I just, I just saw these bishops here, and I just had that vision of that game where this guy killed me with the two bishops against the queen. Okay, uh, never mind. Rook takes, rook takes, queen takes. Okay, looks good. So, two bishops versus rook, what can be better? I mean, what can be better than the bishop pair? Quote bishop pair. So, beat Karyakin yesterday with two bishops versus queen. Nice! Nice! <laughs> we should bring that game on, and not, not, not the one I was mentioning. <laughs> So, the bishop pair is stronger than love. Yes, yes it is. And in this case, it's going to be tough for white. So, queen g5, trying to, to, to create some threats. Good, good practical option. Queen e7, he was lost though. Oh, that's tough. Queen e7, according to the engine, to the analysis we run here, queen e8 was better, and queen e7 is only a draw, but <laughs> uh, I wouldn't like to play this with white. Queen takes e7, bishop takes e7. Here I wanted to play an endgame though, but bishop e7 was better. Yeah, exactly. This is one of those positions where engine can say one thing, but we're humans, and even though the engine says this is equal, I think any human would take black here. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I think this is what I call playing for two results. <laughs> and this is what I try to do in my games, when, especially when I play for my, for my team. And I don't want to take, you know, too much risk. Um, I think this simplification was great for black from a human point of view maybe from an engine's point of view it's like oh no it was much better this other way queen e8 because you defend this square you have this threat okay maybe engines and grandmasters play that but <laughs> okay ingle thanks for thanks for being there thanks for um uh, proposing this topic, I think it was an interesting one. It's been a while since we don't cover any strategic topics in the in the channel, and it was cool. Let me see. I have one notification here. I don't know what's going on. Ah, <laughs> important. I thought this would be nice for me because the pawns on the queen side are easy to attack, I felt at the time. Okay. I mean, I love having two bishops against the rook. Uh, I usually go for this kind of endgame 
even without considering the specifics of the position, which I should, like uh, which pawns are going to be weak. I mean, in general, I think there's going to be a way. What is this move? Rook e6? Is that a trick? Ah, because if you take on d5, he, he takes on a6. Okay. So bishop c5. And the rook went back to e2. So, I, so he's looking for a trick. Bishop takes d5, rook e5. Okay. So bishop d6. So there's no more tricks, so I guess he goes back to e6, yeah. <laughs> back to c5, funny. And b3, wow, he doesn't want the draw. I don't know, man. I would have repeated with, with white. So b4, that's cool. You repeated a bit. Yeah, and he didn't repeat, which is strange. Um, that's a great pawn, blocking all of his pawns. Now, how are you going to make progress? So he went back. How are you going to make progress if he doesn't move at all? I guess... no. What is brave? Yeah. Well, he can't go to a6. So I guess you have time to play... Yeah, but then there's rook b6 if you move the king. Push the king. Yeah, but we cannot push the king. The thing is... Ah, he's going to be in Sook's one. Maybe. Soon. Hmm. I mean, if he does nothing, and by nothing I mean h3, king h2, stuff like that, What are? how are you going to make progress? That's what I'm having a hard time. Because if bishop c8, there's rook c6. If, if uh, this bishop ever goes back somewhere, there's rook b6. No, there's no rook b6. There's no rook b6. So maybe maybe bishop e7, a5, and take on d5. Yeah, maybe a5 first, then, then bishop e7. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's going to be tough for him to keep that pawn. OK. Anyway, he, he went back. So you could, you could push the king. Nice. Now your king is better. And uh, your king is defending e5, so you took the pawn and, and gave a6. Um, I don't know, I guess it's it's great. But <laughs> I would have kept improving the position first. I don't see anything for white. But okay, so now he's sort of threatening rook a5. You go with your king defending your bishop. So after rook a5 you can basically Either play king d4 or just move this bishop. King d4. Rook b5, no threat at all. Mm, thinking funny moves here like bishop d6. And you play bishop d6. Nice. Um, so my idea is maybe you're, you're going to dominate that rook very soon. Uh, for example, a plan could be if he does nothing, like for example, if he moves the king, control these squares, then play bishop c6, and the rook can go here. Well, maybe he can, but uh, he has that as well. Okay, never mind. Let me, let's see how the game continues, but uh, the bishops are clearly better than the rook. Rook there, which. Is, okay, now you hit this. Yeah, this is. The rook is doing nothing, basically. He, he had to go to b8 to have something back here, he had to go to b8 <laughs> otherwise. So he lost that tempo and then he, he went to b8. Takes, rook b7 now. Trading all those pawns. This reminds me of a game I, I once played when I basically burned the bridges to promote a pawn. But in this case you're not even burning any bridges. You're totally fine here. I would have gone here, winning the tempo and then b3, but okay. Good conversion here. Now two bishops versus uh, versus those two pawns. Then I had to mate with two bishops. Yeah, of course you had to. King c3. Okay, 
That wouldn't be my move. My move would be this. And then this. But okay, I guess you're gonna win anyway. Came there. He didn't push the pawns. So now you have time to, that, to do that. Nice. Uh, came there, came there, there, there. Okay. Okay, let's see how you did it. No stalemate, please. There you go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so bishops. Now bishop here could be an option. Took. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Good technique. King a6, and there you go. <laughs> it took you a while, yeah. So here. I mean, any any point in this diagonal uh, would be checkmate in two after that. So checkmate in three from here. But you played right there, so then you cannot go to this diagonal to do check. Bummer. <laughs> there you go. Now, now yes. Now yes. And he resigned. Good job. Okay, well played, um, Infernal. A good game. Um, very, very strong bishop pair there. Uh, rare mate. I saw this in my head after king of three, I believe. <laughs> well, when you know these endgames, you, you can play them automatically. It's good to, to study sometimes. If, if you have time, you can... This is an easy one to find over the board, so... It's not so important. For example, knight and bishop. Uh, if you study it, you can do it in seconds. If you don't study it, well, getting it over the board, you know, solving it over the board, it would be, it would be tough. I didn't see the quicker mate though. No, you didn't. <laughs> oh, nobody. Are you sharing the game of so versus kayaking? Let me see. One second. Yes, okay. I was wondering, did you cover any openings where you gambit a pawn for the bishop pair? Uh, no, I didn't. I think I didn't. <laughs> oh, it's a short game. Ah, no, this is, this is not the game number three, sorry. <laughs> game number three. I hear someone did knight and bishop and won their high school team the match. Okay, cool. Uh, let me see if I can export this. And the high school coach told me he doesn't know how to do it, but figure it out over the board. Oof, that. That's tough. That's tough. One second, guys. Although I suspect his opponent helped a bit. Okay, give me a second, guys. On YouTube, you can see the ladies world champion. Yeah, all right, I saw that. <sighs> Study PGN, chapter PGN. Developer typing speed. <laughs> so even GM sometimes mess up. Yeah, sure. Uh, so let's add this chapter from PGN. One second, guys.
All right, so we have do 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 so versus karyaking. That's a very cool thing. This kind of stream session is it? We had some in the past about you know covering some strategical concepts. Uh, I think Karmar was the first to request this kind of topic. Uh, my favorite with endgame and tactics. <laughs> uh, I think it's cool. I, I, every time I do a stream like this, I feel like I'm improvising a lot. I have nothing prepared, I'm randomly talking, so <laughs> I have the feeling it, it, it should not be instructive at all, but for some reason people like it, so... How did you do that? Couldn't find a way to get a PGN on that page? Yeah, I got a PGN, but it got downloaded... Ah, you couldn't find a way, oh sorry. So when you're in a study, uh, it's gonna be... I can show you, because here where I have the computer analysis, you have another button that is to share, share and export. Is uh, right to the right. You have the I help button, and right to the left of that is the share and export. And then you have study PGM, chapter PGN, and clone. And chapter PGN downloads the chapter and study all you know a PGN with all the the game the the chapters in the study. And and then you can clone the study as well on Liches. So you have those three buttons, and then you have URLs to share as well. Um, so I just downloaded the PGN of, of that specific chapter, and I just <laughs> created it here on this on my study. Underneath the video, underneath the video, what video? Uh, Okay, <laughs> I don't know what video. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's have a look at this game. So Wesley So was white, Sergei, Minister of Defense was black, C45, this is uh, the so-called uh, reversed uh, Sicilian, English, English opening. There's an embedded video from Spielman under the game. Is it? Oh, oh, in the in the website. Ah, uh, in the web. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I didn't even realize there was a video. <laughs> okay, so Nancy Six. Maybe because I opened it in a very narrow uh, browser window. Uh, maybe the layout was a bit different for me. But okay. <laughs> um. C3, G3, so far so good, Knight D5, Bishop C5. This reminds me a lot to the Rosolimo, right? It's like a reverse Rosolimo with Bishop B4. So we're playing a reverse Sicilian with E5, C4, and Bishop B4 happened. Anyway, Knight D5, Bishop B5, preserving the Bishop for the moment, D6, E3, and D4, of course. And Bishop G4... Look at that. If you take my bishop, I'm going to play e4 and regain the piece. But that's definitely a bishop fair for someone. Cool, 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 cool. Nice e3. And he didn't take the piece immediately. He went knight e5. Rawr, I'm going to put more pressure. Take your piece one way or the other. And here it comes, the queen sack. Whoa. Isn't that a sexy move? Which is probably not working, but... <laughs> Whoa! So... So is lost on move 11. It was despair. Okay, so... So is lost... But you say he won this game, right? So he, he found... He found... Uh, the complications and the... Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just seeing now at the diagram how white won in the end. Um, so, <laughs> nice. I mean, I understand the position is, is horrible. It looks horrible here after... Uh, that was a sexy move. So let's go back. Bishop g4. That's sexy. 
And after takes e4, apparently knight c3 was a mistake. There was c takes d6 or h3. Yeah, all very, all very complex. You need to calculate everything and see what the outcome of every line is. Okay, so he took the knight. Let's see how this continued. Bishop takes. Bishop g4 was a novelty. Nice. Looked like the Blackburn legal trap, but with Castle King, so it doesn't work. Yeah, no. Yeah. But, yeah, um, that kind of queen suck, yeah, when you take on e5 with the knight. I understand what you mean. Um, knight takes f7. So if you take my knight, I'm going to take your bishop. Knight takes this, it keeps with the same. Um, same idea. Why wouldn't he take the knight here? Maybe he's trying to save the the bishop for some reason. Or does the king have a problem on f7? I don't get it. Well, d6 is going to be weak anyway. So king takes f7, rook takes d1, and d6 is going to be weak after cd cd so he wanted this for some reason okay whatever ah uh -huh. okay okay I, I, I will not <laughs> question Kariakin <laughs> in the in the labor of defending but yeah it's hard for me to understand most moves hello Pepo2 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 how should I where are you from? <laughs> Where are you from? Maybe I can I can pronounce it better. Queen takes f7 was okay too. Queen e7 was better. Okay, okay, that's that's enough. That's enough for me. If you say it's better, I mean I trust Karyak in, in, in the art of defense, definitely. Pepe 2. <laughs> Pepe 2. <laughs> Bishop e1. Welcome. Welcome to the channel, Pepo Teo. I don't know how to pronounce your nickname. That's my problem. Rook d3. Rook takes, pawn takes. That's a passer now. I would have gone bishop d2 and then after... <laughs> after knight e4... Bishop takes e4... Nah. I would have gone bishop d2. Never mind, rook d1. Makes sense. I'm pinning as well, more flexible probably. Bishop f1, queen f5 defending, knight d5 um, blocking so he can take on d3. That's called an interference, right? This is an interference tactical theme. Knight takes d5. Uh, so the problem with bishop takes d3, I thought it could be some knight takes e3 or stuff like that. Or am I dreaming here? Anyway, rook takes. Safer. Now you take the knight. A5, d4. With with a very subtle threat here. Very subtle threat. <clears throat> so so this is this game. Two bishops for a queen. But okay, the reality is two bishops and three pawns for a queen. So it's uh, actually <laughs> material equality. <laughs> Um, this is it. Strong bishops versus queen. Yes, we 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 got we got here. Queen b one. Still, this looks. The queen looks strong in this position. Have to say. Because the, yeah, especially the dark square bishop. Okay, the dark square bishop will have now better spots. Oh, I expected bishop d4, but, well, I guess a pawn is a pawn. And now it comes the blunder. How did he blunder that? I can see bishop f8. Oh, seven seconds. I'm seeing, ah, yeah. He had seven seconds left. So he blundered bishop f8. Oof, that. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, oh. Oh, bishop b5. Oh, 
sneaky. Rook d6 is unbelievable blunder. Yeah, reminds me of well, a worse blunder was uh, the one that. Um, uh, how how is he called Korean player when he blundered a full rook against Kasparov? I can't recall his name right now. I'm so disconnected <laughs> from from the elite right now. Um, I'm seeing his face, but I can't remember the name. Korean. Yeah, I think he's Korean. Oh, oh maybe I'm actually wrong about the nationality itself. Um, so bad at this. I clipped that on Twitch. There's a clip where... <laughs> with a lot of views uh, that I clipped it of the moment where he did that and I titled it as mouse leap, over the board mouse leap because it was like a mouse leap, he put the rook in, in a square where he could be taken and this reminded me of that and the the expression of Kasparov was like what, what, you blundering the rook there? yeah sorry, I, I think it, he's not Korean, he's maybe from the... I was going to say from the Philippines, but maybe he's from uh, from Thailand. Oh, man. I have a blank mind right now. Sorry, don't, don't mind me. Let's keep the game going. Although... Oh, Rook C4. Oof. <laughs> Ouch. So first the rook, then the queen. Oh, he had to play king d8 here. He was so clever. Oh, let's keep the rook defended so I can take the bishop. Ouch. Oh. GMs need to play more bullet. They never, then they never play rook d6 here. Quan Liang, yes, Quan Liang. Li Quan Liang. Where is Li Quan Liang from? <laughs> Tell me that, please. I need to know it now. Lee Li Kuang Liam, that's the player. Um, he, he, Vietnam, Vietnam. Well, I was, <laughs> I was close. I was, <laughs> I was surrounding the the country. I said Korea, <laughs> then I said Philippines, and then I said Thailand. So it's in the middle of those three countries. <laughs> Vietnam, yes, he's Vietnamese. It's close, yeah. Um, then my next guess is would, would have been Laos, Cambodia. <laughs> okay, so yeah, he had this game where, well, it was a blitz game, but over the board. And he's a very good player. He's 2700, 27 something against Kasparov. And he put the rook in, in a square where Kasparov just can't simply take it. It's even more of a blunder than King E7 here because at least this implies a skewer, but that was like <laughs> losing, hanging it in one move. <laughs> and Kasparov was like, what What are you doing, man? <laughs> it's funny. But yeah, this was a total collapse here. Rook D6, check. Let's keep the Rook defended. Rook C4, oof, the, oh. Hey, greetings, Gornaki. What is up? Okay, thanks for sharing that game. Uh, now I might find... I think I'm gonna find the game I was referring to earlier. The one where I lost with Queen versus the two bishops. But definitely I, I entered a, a losing position where I, I spent... I have to say it was a long time ago. I was a very impractical player, as I mentioned before. So I spent a lot of time finding a tricky way to capture uh, his queen. And by the moment I took the queen for a lot of material, I, I can't remember, I think it was for a rook and something more. By the moment I, I, I took the queen, I was lost. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I remember rook e8, bishop b5 takes e8. 
Oh, you remember the Lee Kuan Yew game? Okay, cool. Now let's see my game. You you won't remember that. I think it's on ChessDB. ChessDB. Doval. So thankfully, if if any player wants to prepare against me, uh, uh, my my only online games are full of blunders. So that's perfect. So I think this game will be there. <laughs> there are only old games by me here. Yes. So has to be here. Here, here it is. Liam had a really red face after that. <laughs> yeah. So this is the game. Can I export this to PGN? I, I might copy this. I can copy this. Yeah, copy. Hyperborax, thanks for the follow. Okay, I could copy the PGN somehow, the moves at least. So if I paste here, create chapter. Wernaki, you're following. I thought you were following already. Okay, so uh, let's see how I got stupidly defeated in this game. And then I might show some other of my games, at least to show a win. <laughs> Man, technology. Yeah, you were not following. Terrible, horrible. Okay, as you can see from the computer analysis, White was winning all the game. So I, I found a clever way to, to win a queen for a lot of material, obviously a losing idea. And in the end, I was totally killed by a bishop pair. And I had a queen. My opponent didn't have a queen, but I had absolutely nothing to do against the bishop pair because my king was so exposed. So exposed. So, uh, I have to say, let me look at the year this was played. It was... No, I don't have it here, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I copied only the moves. This was played in 2008. You know, that was my first year playing chess, so... <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, my opponent was 2171. Let me see. Yes, 2171, exactly. Have good memory. Um, and I played the Dutch back then. So, almost a CM there. Yeah. So let's move fast until the moment I, I... I don't even know what I was playing there, but okay. Let's move to the moment. A Dutch playing Pepe. I was playing the Dutch here with black. So I'm sorry, I... 2171, but from which country? From Spain. Yeah, he's from Spain. We're, we're playing an international... international open tournament, which was my first tournament ever. And... Yeah, I got to lose a lot of games. <laughs> but I also won. Uh, Ah, you're just joking. Okay. <laughs> yeah, from Spain. We, we uh, I, I didn't play any any foreigner play foreign player in that in that specific tournament, if I remember correctly. But I defeated uh, a a twenty three hundred. That was good, to be my first year playing. So, like you know, as I mentioned, I played bullet before, etc. Uh, anyway, here I, I I was looking for a way. Hey, I got no. I was thinking. I was gonna say I have the bishop pair. No, my opponent also has the bishop pair. What am I saying? Ninety five, which was a bad move. Apparently, queen takes a two could be played, but of course I didn't want any of that. I played b five. Rar. And I found a way here. I gave that pawn with the idea to lure that queen to b7 and for him to take my rook on a eight. So this this was all a very clever strategy for me to take the queen, look at that, c6, forcing queen b7, and now I take that, I take that, he does that, I do this, and this was my idea. And I'm like, yes, I'm gonna take his queen, because, <laughs> because I'm threatening checkmate on, B8, on b2, so he cannot take on a7. 
and obviously I gave tons of material for that queen so that was very stupid and it probably took me like 30 minutes to find those those lines when when I played c6 so very stupid very stupid very um, impractical yeah I was like after the game I was like mm, something went really wrong here I spent a lot of time trying to to <laughs> to take a queen and then and look at this position he's he's saving the bishop also taking another pawn and look at this king now so you're about to see <laughs> uh, no thanks for the challenge but no no you're about to see how my king is gonna get crushed by that bishop pair with no mercy at all uh, I'm still trying I'm still trying attack here here but yeah he's not worried about about the a2 pawn at all and of course i spent a couple of tempi to to grab that pawn bishop a6 which wasn't the best move anyway i took on g2 rook there Ugh. Uh, that's a small threat cut your hair never no just kidding um and now I think I played a terrible move, although, wow, I mean, the engine goes from plus 3 to plus 7. I mean, the position is already already terrible. What, what should I do here, apart from resigning? I think here, when I was playing this position, I don't recall it very well, because it was 11 years ago, but I think I, I was still not thinking that I was in so much trouble. I, I was like, I'm a queen up. I, I have to have something here. <laughs> bishop G2. yeah bishop g2 is crazy oof that <laughs> yeah oof that um i was like no no no, man i'm fine i'm defend I, I defend everything now bishop h3 and i defend everything rook is seven obviously anyway because you know even if it doesn't win a knight because i'm defending it rook on the seventh main now uh Look at this king. Bishop is somehow protecting uh, f8. This bishop will come to c4. Uh, and then the final the final touch is going to be playing b3, obviously, to play bishop b2. Bishop c4, yeah. King h8. Rook takes knight. Very beautiful. Beautifully executed. Queen h1 check. King a2. Bishop takes d7 now. And of course, he doesn't take my bishop back. He plays b3 and I resign. And the moment he played b3, and, uh, yeah, he played b3 so confidently. I mean, I, I remember that moment. I took the rook and he immediately played b3 and I was like, oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I hate when that happens. And this was a classical game. Hey, Blue King, thanks for the follow. This, I mean, it's not like a Blitz game, so I'm, I'm sure this kind of thing happened to me in Blitz games, but this was the only time in my life I, a thing like this, like, you know, uh, being totally checkmated with a move like B3 in the end and having to resign. Yeah. So I guess this also makes a good example of a strong bishop pair. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Specifically the bishop that I don't have, the dark square bishop. It's definitely the one killing me here. Yeah. So yeah, that was painful. That was painful. Bishop before was just as painful. Yeah, bishop b4, the same idea. A strong b pawn too. Yeah, <laughs> but b3 was so, so you know, so nice. You come. Uh, good night, Infernal Cash. Thanks for stopping by. I remember. I think I don't know who was it. Maurice Ashley. Someone uh, at some point proposed to find the most or the nicest moves that cause resignation. 
like b3 is nicer than bishop b4 to cause resignation because it, you know you push the pawn from b2 to b3 and your opponent resigns it's like wow <laughs> and and of course there are some games where castling uh, causes resignation so those are cool moves to 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 make your opponent resign b3 is like oh Because actually, uh, bishop b4, I can't think, of course I, I should resign, <laughs> but at least I can think of sacrificing the queen for the bishop and make the game a bit longer. But b3, I don't even have a way to, to sacrifice the queen for the bishop. It's like, what? what? <laughs> it's, I mean, it's the shortest checkmate, I think. My best was h2, h3. Sucks one with loads of pieces. Nice. Makes you want to be accused of battery by your opponent. Like dandy move. Oh, so b3, huh? Have this smacks him upside the head. <laughs> yeah. I think I had some funny moves that caused resignation of my opponents. Trying to remember. Do you know the actual ill rating of this first opponent? This first could be thing to see the evolution with time. What? No, no, no. He was twenty one seventy one at that moment. I don't know. Ah, the current rating of him. I can find it. I have his name. Uh, Lozoya Rodriguez, I can tell you, ratings, but he was, yeah, he's probably my age, so he was young. Uh, are you saying actually instead of current, are you Spanish, Tentaches? <laughs> uh, okay, Lozoya Rodriguez. French. Oh, so in French you have the same problem. 20, 21, 90 right now. And yeah, he's two years younger than me, than I, than me. Uh, 21, 90. So yeah, he didn't improve a lot since, since back then. I improved. <laughs> uh, so we're talking about here, here, 21, 71. Here's when we played. And then he went up to 22, and then he went down, down, up, down. He's more or less stable around 2200. And I still, I still didn't get there. And my progress is too slow. Anyway, that was a bit embarrassing, <laughs> that game, yeah. I had worst, though. I'm okay with that. Okay, so I was going to show one more game, I think. I have more here, but I wanted to show this one because I think um, it's a clear example of what I do when I when I try to... to well, it's not exactly what I do, but we talked about conversions of bishop pair to some kind of advantage, and we talked about one that we didn't see an example of it, and we have it here, which is going for an opposite color bishops. So trading one of the bishops for the knight. I mean, you have the bishop pair, your opponent has bishop and knight. You trade one of the bishops for the knight, resulting in an opposite color bishop uh, position. And I said, I would only do that to play for the wing if I have heavy pieces and I think I have more activity than my opponent because then, then I can put pressure because, you know, opposite color bishops, attack, initiative... Um, and then you draw no I won the game actually I had to win this game so I was forced to win this game uh, and I won the game which is a terrible game I mean the quality of the game is horrible but, <laughs> but okay I didn't make any blunder so I guess it, it wasn't the worst so this was last year when we when we won the chess league 
So we went, we got the promotion to the first division, 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 league, first league. We were in the second, and and we won the league uh, over two strong teams. One of them with a grandmaster, which is a lot for our level. <laughs> division, division. Okay, um, and I was board number two and uh, yeah this was the last the last uh, game of the league we were tight for first we thought the other team was going to to win clearly to other opponents so we had to to win for for O and we won three three to one because we lost one game very very uh, the horror <laughs> we we lost one game very fast so uh, uh, but I said no we have to win this so we won uh, yeah okay it was very crazy but yeah the thing is we all played terrible games and still managed to for example I managed to win my, my game. Uh, in Angalaping, I played something very stupid in the opening, so let's show it. I said, okay, I'm gonna play for two results. I'm gonna play against the isolated pawn block there at some point. And yeah, okay, I don't know why do I have those arrows. Anyway, um, do I have my opponent wasn't very, very high rated. Let me see if I have. I don't have his rating. I don't know, maybe he was 1800 or something like that. Um, so this was a team that had the stronger players in the low boards. It was something very suspicious, <laughs> but okay. Um, anyway, 94. Um, I preserved my bishop, obviously. A6. I decided to preserve my bishop, although bishop takes e6 would create another kind of imbalance but because I wanted this game to be used today in the bishop per topic I had to preserve my bishops I don't like this line no 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 ugly knights <laughs> bishop e6 bishop c2 horrible 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 knight e2 he took for some reason takes and let's. I'm gonna move fast until we get to the two bishops. And obviously he plays d4, and he gets rid of, of the of the problem. Now if I take, uh, it's gonna be so 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 equalish. Actually, I think black pieces are better. So, so yeah. Here I decided to complicate things and create some imbalances because I need to win. So bishop e7, rook e1. I don't want to take. I don't want to take on d4 and make life easier for him. I want to force him to play d3 or d takes c3. Um, he took, which is good for me. And obviously, I could take with the knight, and it's horribly, horribly symmetrical and equal. Uh, so I decided to play b takes c3 to play an unbalanced position again. I, I need to win. And now he plays this horrible move, f5. Horrible move. So up to this point, I had no no idea how how could I win this. But um, symmetrical but not equal. Uh, after knight takes, um, I don't know. I actually think black is probably better. <laughs> <laughs> I think if any. Knight b4, d3. Yeah, exactly. I think his pieces are, are better than mine. He has the rooks already in the center, um, controlling the d file. He has the knight is better than my knight. The bishops are great. Black is much better, you say. Yeah. The engine says this is minus 0 0.1, but uh, yeah, I take black as well. <laughs> so. So yeah, b takes c3. We are human, yes we are, exactly. And okay, so b takes. Um, 
I'm controlling specifically the, those squares that uh, I was also worried about them of course and uh, yeah I want some some unbalance there and now he plays a five and um, so we were in this tense situation last round of the league we had to win every of us I was fighting with my board number three because I was the captain and I was fighting with him because he had a horrible position and his opponent his opponent uh, offered him a draw and he was like let me take the draw <laughs> um, and I was like fuck your rating man uh, you 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 forced it you take the risk uh, we have to win all of us don't <laughs> so I was like uh, very distracted and very tense situation with the team and everything and maybe this was, I don't know, maybe this move F5 happened in the second hour of the game. And I was like, thank goodness, now I have something. F5, why would you play F5? <laughs> so, yeah, okay, my, my opponent took a risky decision here with F5. Um, I played uh, the obvious, Knight G5. And I think we reached the point where the bishop pair situation happens. Uh, because he took on g5, which is questionable. Uh, he has alternatives. Basically, he can move this bishop. Risky to be read as incomprehensible. <laughs> well, I mean, it's risky. I don't, I don't, I don't say he's, he's losing, but... Uh, Bishop c4 is interesting, uh, although it seems to lose this pawn. But yeah, I guess he has a, a tough decision here because if he wants to keep this pawn defended, uh, he, he has to give up on this diagonal. And he probably was scared of something like that. Um, so he took on g5. And I took, of course. And now he played rook c8, trying to build some pressure on my weakness on c3 but now at least i have the bishop pair uh yeah i don't have any clear targets and he has more or less the weaknesses covered uh except b7 maybe but if i ever attack b7 i guess he's gonna push but yeah he has this weak diagonal covered and the same bishop that covers that is defending this weak pawn here so um i would love to have I would love if he has some some dark square weakness because this is the uncontested bishop. You can wing a pawn here. Uh, yeah, I had rook takes e6 followed by bishop takes f5. If that's what you mean, and I think that's what you mean. But again, I <laughs> I I wanted this game to be used today for the bishop pair. Uh, lesson so I wasn't going to give up the bishop pair so easily I'm just kidding <laughs> I, I can let me see my notes because I cannot remember if I didn't see it or oh I don't have the notes here I don't know if I didn't see it or if I just considered uh, I wouldn't go for that for some reason hmm. yeah rook takes e6 I have the line here rook takes e6 something like this I mean the line is, is forced rook takes e6 bishop b3 also interesting he can't move bishop b3 instead of taking the pawn uh, I would take the pawn I mean if I give up the exchange I'm playing for the wing uh, I, <laughs> I don't want to just trade, 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 get to a drone position, even though I still believe the knight, the bishop should be better than the knight. Bishop b3, rook e1. Bishop b3, rook e1. Ah, you mean following up with rook b1? But he can defend the rook several times, and then we trade things, and and we don't we we don't have a pawn up as as in the in the other line. So here, rook takes e6. Yeah, I would take the pawn because at least I'm pawn up, yeah. So here, pawn up, bishop versus knight. Yeah, for some reason I didn't play this. And I think it was the best move. 
yes, we're here in this in this part of the game. These little mountains here. <laughs> Why not play g5 for the sack? g5 for the sack? What? Well, anyway, for some reason, which I don't recall, <laughs> to be honest, uh, this this is funny. Uh, I usually remember my games. That's normal. I remember all like all of my games, and uh, well, it helps that I usually analyze them the day the day after, I guess. But yeah, I can pick a game from five years ago and I remember the game. But this game I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> This game I was so distracted and so tense with everything else and also I didn't analyze it the next day because of course we we won the league, we had to celebrate so this game, I think I wasn't paying a lot of attention to it I was just trying to to keep my to, to keep my small advantages and, and do nothing and not take any risks anyway I played rookie 3 as you can see um, defended my weakness and I have an attacking idea there on, on g3 um, my opponent played uh, h6 which turns out to be a bad move now rook takes e6 was even stronger I think but I moved the bishop and he played bishop d7 so yeah, we're in this part here, we're making mistake after mistake <laughs> according to the engine. Um, rook d3, I didn't want to trade for some reason. Bishop back to e6. Of course, every each and every one of our opponents uh, wanted the draw because uh, the, this team we were playing against, it was uh, the B team, the B team, yeah, the B team of the one that were playing to win the league uh, like us so they were interested in that we didn't win the game so black is playing to draw a, a bad idea yeah exactly so I played rook b1 I said okay if you take an a2 I'll take on b7 and have an active rook on the seventh rank so b5 logical move now, ooh, I thought I played rook g3 here. No, I played a4, rar, and b4. And I think I played rook g3 now. With that idea. You're always playing for the draw. And now, the best move, I think it was uh, h5 and or king f8. Best way to draw is play for the wing. Yeah, exactly. Have a good night, Tenta Chess. Get a good position and convert to draw ending. I agree. So I threatened on h6. Um, he played a human move, but yeah. King h8. And yeah. Those circles I have there means that I have a way to trade all of of those pieces with c takes before obviously and if those pieces disappear those two pawns and the knight and the bishop disappear from the board we have an opposite color bishop position where I think I have a strong initiative because I play e uh, bishop e5 f4 to solidify that bishop and rook b7 to put all the pressure on g7, a6, h6. So I thought this would be a good, a good simplification to a, to a opposite color bishop's position where I could, um, where I could play for the wing. So this is one of those examples we were discussing this uh, before, uh, how to convert two bishops. Uh, by trading one bishop for a knight or one bishop for the bishop and and yeah I did it here c takes before if he doesn't take an open up so he took rook takes before rook takes c2 and 
and yeah, this is a lot of pressure. Actually, he collapsed very, very soon. But yeah, material is equal. Bishops are from opposite colors, but I have I have all the pressure here. Don't I? Uh, oh, nice, Bobby. Uh, <laughs> nice. Have yeah, good luck. Good luck with that. Um, do you know who you play tomorrow? So let's see how the game continued. Yeah, he played uh, rook e7. And I thought I played rook g6 here, but no, I played rook b6. And <laughs> I have arrows here for some reason. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, if I take on g7, I might, I might uh, wing a pawn. Take on g7, trade rooks, take on e6. Then uh, f5, a6 are still weak. Pretty sure black lost this because he didn't play a5 exactly warnaki he didn't play a5 here that was his his bad he played rookie too and now i played oh you play an 18 75 but i guess he's underrated because he has a 21 50 performance so far ah okay okay how old is he okay rookie two and Of course, I played the obvious move here. Now, this is no longer a bishop pair <laughs> discussion. <laughs> this is already a5, rook takes g7. Yeah, rook takes g7 was, was a threat. No, no, I, I'm just kidding. a5 wasn't a good move. <laughs> The rook is not on e2 yet, Bobby. When, when we're talking, the rook is on c2. Uh, and he's saying a5. a5 rook takes g7. So, so yeah. Um, I think the best move was... Bishop d5, actually, here. Bishop d5 was the best move. But anyway, he played uh, rook e2, and I played the obvious move. And... Even after rook e2, rook takes e7. No, but after rook, rook e2, if I play rook takes e7 now, there's rook takes e7. Ah, rook takes e6. No, wait, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> no, 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 it doesn't work. So... Um, yeah, I, here I played the obvious move. I think it's the obvious move. <clears throat> what I always want to do when I have bishop uh, opposite color bishops with with heavies f4 exactly f4 nobody f4 that bishop is. Gorgeous there. I have all the pressure. A6 still hanging. I have all the threats. And here he collapsed, basically. Or, I mean, <laughs> he did a move like, whoa. <laughs> so, yeah, I still, I think I still have to work this position a bit, but thankfully my opponent was, um, was so annoyed of the position that, that, he he decided to why not check him why would i the rook is threatening this pawn if the bishop ever moves the rook can take on h6 i mean the rook is perfect there and it's perfect because it's threatening the weaknesses and because the king is on h8 if i check him i lose my part of my threats part of my threats and the king is going to be better on h7 <laughs> for the sake of it <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Patser sees checks. Well, you have to see the checks always. They could be good moves. They're always strong moves in the way of forcing moves. Anyway, he took on e5, which 
also rook g6 yes rook g6 was my main threat that was my idea my my idea with f4 was to prepare rook g6 to attack this and this i think i'm winning a pawn here at least no matter what i i, I didn't see a way to uh for him to escape me from taking a pawn like for example if a5 i think i play rook g6 Yeah, I have this line here. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize I had this line already here. Yeah. Still, still needs to be worked. King h7 looked like the only move to me. Let's go back. After f4, uh, I don't know why I don't have the king h7 line here. So let's have a look. Do I have rook takes e6 here? No. Maybe I do have it. With this idea. Ah, you take with this rook. You take with this rook. No, 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 sorry. Yeah, my bad. Hmm. Yeah, I only, only, also if you take with the other rook, but yeah, you take with that one. Yeah, 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 no. So there's no rook takes e6. Hmm. Well, I guess I take the pawn. <laughs> I guess here I, I probably just take the pawn then. But try something with g5. You think black can try something with g5 now? No, oh, well, that's cool. I don't know, maybe rook a3 and... Yeah, definitely much better than what he played. But okay, I'm upon up, I have some some threats. Actually, I guess g5 I might be able to play rook a8, I'm thinking now. That way you cannot take here because of the checkmate. And, and take it from there. Oh, I missed bishop d5. Hmm. Check, check. Push it. <laughs> I'm I'm considering this. <laughs> this is stupid. Mm. Trying to trick with rook takes e5 and f4. Yeah. No, definitely this, this position needs to be calculated still a lot. Um, white should be still good, but maybe there was something better than rook a8. Okay, so let's put this on the board. So takes, takes. Thinking this could be interesting. Um, looking really really dangerous for uh, for black isn't it look here maybe okay these lines are too concrete they, they have to be calculated accurately before <laughs> before doing pawn takes g5 of course but looks interesting it looks interesting the other rook on g8, I think both of them, but yeah, the other threatens to promote, so you have a point there. <laughs> but I think this one also works. But yeah, the other is better, it's easier, at least. Uh, ah, actually there's rook takes g2. Yeah, with the one I put there, there's rook takes g2, so... So actually, uh, yeah, I had to do it with the other rook. Okay. Okay, I guess it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to look at the rest of the game because, you know, he took there, but let's just show the rest of the moves real quick. Uh, yeah. And he fell for this. 
bishop takes e6 and he resigned here okay and I think I showed half of the games I had here prepared prepared I mean uh, collected um, uh, maybe more than half of them but I think that was already a very long session um, the one who who asked for it uh, <laughs> already went away it's 3 a.m. here I guess it's a good moment to, to call it a day and I think I'll see you tomorrow I don't remember if there's a match tomorrow I think there's not so for tomorrow I have something like tactics prepared I think um, yeah tomorrow early I'm gonna do tactics 3 a.m. decent time for a nap yeah unconscious horizontal time you're right guys um, I think it was fun again whenever I do this this kind of sessions I feel like I'm improvising a lot uh, but okay some people like it so I guess I guess it's nice and uh, thank you guys for being there sharing in the chat it's really helpful because <laughs> otherwise it could be really boring even for me <laughs> um, let's see if we can raid someone because maybe maybe there's someone out there playing chess really for real not unlike us uh thanks safely thanks warnaki ciao nobody um let's go watch let's go watch let's go let's go uh huh. So I think Metal Eagle is a good call, or maybe not. Actually, the title of the stream is a bit creepy. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's chess only chess now. Okay. Oh uh, no, it's the creepy one. Mm -hmm. it's on the, but I think he's playing on. Yes, he's playing chess. No, so let's go there. <laughs> Have a good night, guys. See you tomorrow. We'll be, we'll, we'll be doing tactics tomorrow. It's going to be fun. We didn't have tactics yesterday because of the crazy as much. But tomorrow, tomorrow I'm finally going to do tactics. Bye-bye. Have a great night. Sleep tight.